Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2023 Driftmasters European Championship. We are here at round two, and we're at the Drive Center AB in Sweden. Now, last year we had absolute heat wave, and we're back with the sunshine again this year. And I've just walked down to a very, very busy paddock because we had our qualifying yesterday, and one of our stars of the show, Calais Rovenpera, managed to secure fourth place in qualifying yesterday after a bit of a nervous start, wasn't it? You were sitting on a zero at first, and then you came back and managed to secure fourth place with a 90. Now what's the pressure like when you're sat on the line? Is it different to rally? I've heard in some places that it can be more testing coming to drifting. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's a bit different because uh, definitely we have a really short period of time to make everything happen on drifting. Um, in rally you have much more, uh, let's say, time to correct your mistakes if you make one. So yeah, it's definitely not, not an easy feeling having the zero on the board, but, uh, but yeah, we made it happen anyway. Absolutely, yes, you did. You look cool as a cucumber out there. I mean, you always do with the sunglasses on and all that. Now, you came for one round last year. You came to Mondello. You had a great showing. You uh, gave quite a wild performance. I remember you battling Kuba Pushkonski last year, and I interviewed you. And I said, Kale, what are you going to do? And you said, I'm going to drop him. And I was like, wow, that's big confidence. Now, what made you come back for four rounds this year? Driftmasters is a great place to be, right? Yeah, it's it's really the best uh, series what we can drive at the moment. The level is super high. Um, I like drifting a lot, so for me it's of course more than a more like a hobby. So yeah, I just try to enjoy. Of course, it's always quite the pressure to to come here because it's a proper event with really high high uh, let's say quality of driver and teams. So, but still, I I try to keep myself calm and enjoy because it's more like a like a holiday for me. But uh, it's it's not always easy. You're the first driver I've ever interviewed that said this is like a holiday, so congratulations for that. Now, speaking of the rounds, you're joining us for four. Are you going to be making an entrance like you did yesterday at all rounds? We saw you just floating in in a helicopter there. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, it's, it's nice to be coming here from Finland. I was sleeping yesterday morning from my own bed straight to here a few hours, so it was easy with the chopper, but uh, yeah, other rounds will be a bit more far away. I was expecting you just turn up in a jet next time. That'd be quite interesting. I'd love that. Now, I'm just looking at the car behind you. Your team are very busy right now. Did you, you were just telling me a cracked manifold right before your first top 32. Not ideal. Can you tell us what happened? Yeah, on the practice, uh, I just made one clean run and then we cracked the, cracked the manifold, exhaust manifold. So didn't get any more practice, no clean chase runs or anything. So if the guys can fix it in time, it, it's going to be tricky for me in the battles because I didn't really practice the chase runs on this track at all. But first thing is to get the car working and then let's see if we can make it to the battles. OK, Kelly. well, good luck in your first round. I'm going to move out the way so your team can get to work. As I can see, it's all go here. Thank you so much. And we'll see you on the track very soon. Let's take a look at that bumper stacked calendar for the rest of the, of the year. Now, we have got in four weeks' time heading to a brand new track in Finland, the Power Park, which is going to be very exciting as no driver has driven on this track before. Then in July, we're going to head to Riga for that amazing round, one of the fastest, most dangerous tracks on the calendar. Then in August for round five, we head to Ferropolis in Germany, and then all roads lead to round six, which is the PGE Arena in Warsaw. That is going to be fantastic. A huge stadium, the biggest of the entire season. Now, we are going to take a quick look at what happened at round one in Mondello. For all of you that missed it, you're going to want to take a look at this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ireland, welcome to Mondello Park, and welcome to round one of the Driftmasters European Championship 2023. The egos are stacking up, and the competition is getting hotter than ever. Shanahan catches under stiff. Shanahan has to back out. Now Vincek starts to pull away. Peter Vjainsek gets the win. Peter Vjainsek goes through. A big initiation from Vincek, and he starts to pull already. And can he hold on to it? He can, but Shanahan gets under stiff. It's going to be Peter Vjainsek. Peter Vjainsek goes into the final in Ireland. McKeever absolutely fires that car in on initiation. Taking third step on the podium will be Dwayne McKeever. The last battle of the day, the final. Look at Vincek, he's not letting Heinen get away with this one, but he does let a little bit of separation open up. Can he really mean? Is that the game? Oh! Heinen and throws it off the circuit. He tries to go faster than he's been all weekend, and it doesn't pay off. Winning the event two years in a row is Peter Vincek.
Straight from Mondello, Peter Viensek taking the win with Laurie Hahn and right behind him. And that story actually continues into the championship standing. So let's take a look at those as they stand so far. Coming into round two, in first place we have Peter Viensek, followed very closely, just 20 points behind him, Laurie Heinenen. In third place, Dwayne McKeever. Fourth, Connor Shanahan. Fifth, James Dean, followed by Jack Shanahan in sixth. Kevin Piscolti coming up the ranks in seventh and in eighth, Pontus Hartman. It's all heating up. It's only just round two, but you know what? It never, ever stops the action here. But you know what drifting's like. It's unpredictable. So I've come down to the paddock to have a chat with Adam Zalewski because, Adam, you've gone out for practice. Your car is sat here very quietly. Can you tell us what's happened? I hear it's an engine failure. Yeah, so after the briefing, I came back to the pit and my mechanic was already taking out the cam cover, checking out what's going on. They heard, uh, as they started the engine before, they heard some knocking. Um, and they take, took out the cam. They were trying to see what's uh, happening with the valves. And basically, here is like a small sneak peek. Um, the middle of the part in here is like sunk in completely and rather th this one is like the good one that we actually need to have. So we don't want to uh, risk the engine uh, on the competition so we kind of back out from the competition right now. Uh, we just don't want to blow something uh, because I'm lacking the budget for this season and it's just tough to go from the competition to competition. So um, it's better to save it right now and just do the head of the engine rather than later change the whole engine and spend like a lot of money on, on it. So it is what it is. I wanted to give a big show um, in top 32 because a big, it, it's actually a big battle with Conor Shanahan. We, I know that we would give uh, a big show for the people as always we actually do. So I'm really sad about it, but I have to keep my head up and try to do uh, my best during the next uh, rounds in Finland and later um, on the next round. So let's keep pushing for now. And that's it. Basically. We're sorry to hear that, Adam. And you know what? We're really looking forward to seeing you out in Finland in four weeks' time. We'll see you very soon. Yep. So let's take a little walk down here. Now, in practice this morning, Oren Nilsson unfortunately suffered a roll in one of his runs. Now, last year, you know, he had that accident where he very nearly rolled. Well, this year, he just hasn't had the luck. And the, even when he got third in qualifier, he went out, was pushing it all on the line, and unfortunately, the car went over. I've had a chat with him. He is OK, but the team are working round the clock right now to get that car back and hopefully on the line for top 32. We will catch up with him later, but right now, we're just going to let his team do their thing. One other thing, it was Laurie Heinenen last night. We were going to get an interview with him, but we're actually going to catch up with him just as he comes out of his top 32 battle because he's right at the starting grid. So we're going to let him get prepared for that and we will have that chat with him in just a bit. Let's try and catch Connor Shanahan right here. Looking very suave in the sunglasses. I like those. Thank How you. are you feeling ahead of today? Because I know last night your team worked extremely hard to get the new engine in. Is everything running smoothly now? Um, I wouldn't say everything is 100%, but much better than it was yesterday. Uh, two practice laps, we think everything is good. Uh, the laps were actually quite decent. I uh, would have liked to get more to get a little bit more chase experience, but quite good at that Zaleski has to go out this way. I don't want to beat anybody this way. Um, you know, that's a, a very unfortunate thing to happen. To be honest, I was quite looking forward to his battle. Um, I have a hard side of the bracket if I want to do well today. So I was looking forward to try to get a chase run in there and advance onto the top 16. but. Yeah, we'll uh, take the boy run, hopefully everything goes to plan and we advance through to the top 16. We have maybe one small problem, what needs to be fixed in the break, the team have done a quick fix now, we think for sure it will hold up for the boy run and uh, they've done an incredible job. As always, I'm proud of them, uh, my dad was on the road until 4.30 in the morning last night getting a head uh, machine and stuff, so it's always passion, that's what we drive with 24-7, this team has, uh, has been built off passion and a heart what is bigger than anyone on this grid I think. So. Thank you so much to my incredible team. Uh, without them, uh, to be honest, yesterday I thought it was game over. So the fact that I'm having an interview after qualifying, this is already a win in my eyes. But a win in my eyes is always that step on the podium also. So if everything goes to plan, I plan to, to drive hard today, give it my all, and uh, fingers crossed we can get a good result. Absolutely, I've got no doubt in you. I mean, I love the fact that you're using a buy run now. It's almost like a run-in for the car. Yeah, I think uh, I'll actually take it as a practice lap here and uh, just make sure everything is good before we get into the rhythm of things. Uh, there's a high chance, obviously, we'll come up against Laurie in the top 16. He seems to be the man to beat at the moment, so a lot of respect for that guy also. Hopefully, uh, I will see him in the top 16 or whoever he is battling, but either way, there is no easy battle now. If you want to beat these guys, no matter it's top 32 or the final, 
I think everybody in Drift Masters inside this top 32 now can give it a fight and uh, have a chance of getting to the podium. So the saying goes, if you want to beat them, it doesn't make a difference whether it's in the top 32 or the final. So that's the game plan for today. Just take them down on the way if everything goes to plan with the car. And uh, fingers crossed I get in a rhythm myself. Being honest, I don't know how I will drive because I've, after such little practice, I feel like I'm in no groove at all. So everything, I just hope everything falls into place for me. I'm sure it absolutely will, Connor. You've got the luck of the Irish on your side today. So good luck in your top th oh, sorry, in your top 16 battle, not your top well, 32. Get this Byron first. You've got to get through the Byron first, absolutely. Right, guys, so let's take a quick look at the weekend format. Obviously, we're here with our top 32 battles this morning, uh, this afternoon, actually. And then we will be taking a short break when we will come right back with our top 16 after our top 16 parade, and then straight through to those finals and see who is going to win this year. It's going to be a big one. This track always throws up lots of different, lots of different uh, experiences. So we're going to see how it all plays out. But for now, I'm going to stop talking. Hand, hand you back up to Ian Waddington and Dave Egan. Guys, it's going to be a massive show. Absolutely, Becky. And the sun is shining. The conditions are perfect. Just enough breeze in the air to move that smoke cloud over the track. The grandstands are filling up. And boy, have we changed Drift Masters into Drama Masters this weekend. As you heard, Connor Shanahan having an engine problem yesterday, fixing an engine, and his opponent has an engine problem this morning, and he gets through. So from one way to another for Connor Shanahan, we talked about uh, Aaron Nielsen having a huge double rollover in practice, and they're still trying to get that car back together. One of the biggest problems, they're cutting out Alexan windscreen for the car because it is regulation that they have it and also Nakamura having some hits in practice as well it's been an incredible scene to watch behind the scenes but now for you guys we are about to go live in top 32 and it's a very stacked top 32 when you see that bracket lay in you know we are in for one day of entertainment my name is Dave Egan I'll be talking you through all of the action alongside my good friend and colleague Ian Waddington Ian we're going to try and explain a lot today but I think it's going to do a lot of explaining for itself because this is going to be a tough one I think it certainly is going to be a tough one Dave yeah we learned a lot yesterday in qualifying between us and the judges and the drivers themselves watching how this track evolved watching the layout and seeing how these guys adapted to it and i think today's going to be the same kind of story i think we're all going to learn together we're all going to grow together in this um, event because I don't think anybody knows how they're going to make it through this weekend. We spoke about it yesterday, me and you. A lot of drivers were doing a lot of different things on different parts of the circuit, and I think that is going to play out today. We see some big hits in practice, some rollovers, some contact between guys, and I think that's the unpredictability of this track. It's so fast, and it's also technical. It takes a lot to get around there, and everyone is doing it in their own different way, even though they're on that qualifying line. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, if the cars don't take them out, if the opponent doesn't take them out, the judges will take them out, because they are the guys making the decisions. Kevin O'Connell, our head judge, is standing by to talk to us about this very technical and difficult track. Kevin, it is fast, but it's also tough to get it right. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Dave and Ian. This is one of the trickiest tracks on the season this year. Extremely high speeds, but it's also very, very technical. And as you guys said, a lot of drivers are using their own techniques to get around this track. And we're looking to make sure that every driver is trying to get on that qualifying line as quickly as possible. So what we are actually looking for from the lead car is to hit all of those clipping zones, but also maintain that correct line that we're looking for between all of those clipping zones, make th maintain consistent angle throughout the whole course, and also drive sort of chase car can follow that means decelerating where we're looking for them to decelerate and making sure that they're on that correct qualifying line the whole way throughout the course as for the chase car obviously we want that impact we want them to maintain as close proximity for as long as possible initiate no later than the lead driver match or better the lead driver's angle that's very important on this course we don't want to see them sacrificing too much angle and of course mimic the lead driver's transitions and line we saw it last year we had some absolutely amazing battles here and we can't wait to have some more today Thank you, Kev. Good to hear from you guys. We'll be touching back in with you guys if we get any interesting decisions to let everyone know what they're thinking and their crazy robotic drift brains that are so much larger than ours and easy to make those decisions. But we can talk about it, but let's visualize it. This is the circuit that we are going to be challenging the best in Europe and further afield today. It is a tough one. It has got an incredible layout with a lot of undulations, a lot of changes of direction. It's got two deceleration zones, six outer zones, two inner zones, and it's 640 meters in length. And this is what it looks like. You come off that start line. It is all go, full power, all the way down to that first corner. A bit of a weight transfer, a flick into outer zone one, and that's where this roller coaster begins. Flat out through the inner zone two, tucking the nose in as you push the car extremely wide out to outer zone three. This 
all full throttle. And then at the only, just when you come past outer zone four, that's when they want to see a little bit of deceleration as you try and lock the back wheels, get in and tuck the nose into this very challenging inner zone. There's an unnatural racing line here through the center of the course, the opposite of the racing line, in fact, to outer zone seven. Then another deceleration zone where you got to switch the direction of the car, tuck in if you're the chase driver and if you're the lead driver, put foot to floor and run that big outer zone at the end up along that concrete wall. And ladies and gentlemen, it does not move. You hit it, which we saw some guys do yesterday. It is going to take your car out. It is in a very, very tough track. A lot of speed at the start, a lot of technicality at the end. And this is the amazing lineup we have for you guys today. Top 32 looks like a final after a final. Some of the biggest names in the game are getting very big challenges straight away. Look at our current championship leader, Peter Vjainsek. He's got Alex Holovnia straight away in the top 32. That'll be very interesting to see how it plays out. As you said, we were robbed of Connor Shannon and Adam Zalewski, but Connor Shannon will move through to that top 16. Laurie Heinen, our top qualifier, taking on a Swedish wild card. We don't know what to expect from Alfred Greinberg when he comes into that battle, but he could shake up the championship as well. And Kali Rovapera, the WRC champion, will take on another newcomer to our championship, Victor Vetmark. So, you know what? There's how it stands. We've got people in there from all over the world. we got all sorts of different chassis, shapes and sizes, a crazy fast track. But you know what? I'm sick of talking. I want to get to walking. We are about to head to our top 32. The stage is set for an unbelievable top 32. Usually we wait till the 16 or the 8 to get into the mix, but right now I feel we're hitting it from the off. We've got a lot of unknown contenders in here. We've got a lot of interesting matchups for you guys. It's going to be entertainment from start to finish here at round two of the Drift Masters European Championship. Here in Sweden, Falfors at the Drive Center Arena. We are about to head to our first battle with Laurie Heinen, our top qualifier from Finland, taking on the wild card from Sweden, Alfred Greinberg. Big one coming up here, Ian. Yeah, certainly is a big one. We would always say the first qualifier would walk all the way through straight away in to top 16, but you can't count anyone out at the moment. Right now, this young man on the line, Alfred Grinberg, has been set, has been pumped up by the locals to say he is an up-and-coming superstar. Can he prove himself right now by taking down one of the biggest names in European drifting, Laurie Heinen? And well, this is the stage to do it, and we're almost ready to go. You see those lights illuminating on the star line. We get the green light. We are good to go. Heinen to lead out Grinberg, and they're off through the chicane. Look at Heinen looking over. Slots the car into the gear. Big clutch kick initiation from Heinen. He's been flawless all weekend. Can he keep it up? He does already. Grinberg catches Massive understeer, just cannot hang and gets lost in the smoke screen that Laurie Heinen's S13 is throwing up right now as he comes down into that second in the zone. Looks for the transition. Heinen is absolutely up and gone. He's just going to show the pace, the skill, the talent this young man has as he gets into that final outside zone. Tires completely destroyed as he gets across the line. Well, that goes to show that, you know, you, you have a very talented national youngster there in a national series looking incredible. Then you take it up a notch to the European level and he went into that first first corner and he probably got a little disbelief at how fast Laurie <laughs> Heinehan went in there. Laurie Heinehan running over a thousand horsepower with a NASCAR V8 in that car and what it noticed, noticed instantly is the fact that once they went into that first corner the smoke screen went up. It's going to be an issue all day. Laurie Heinehan throws up a ton of smoke. All of a sudden Alfred can't see where he's going. He loses his bearings and all of a sudden when he comes out of that smoke cloud Heinehan's gone with a huge advantage and as you can see from the rest of the run it's almost a throwaway. He can't get back into the groove or back into the mix but the icy cold stare of Laurie Heinehan, the constant Concentration, the Iceman. He is not making mistakes this weekend. And that's one thing we talked about with Laurie Heinen from the start, is that he was always a good driver. But once he, but he was consistently good. But when he became great, like he is this year, he's consistently great. And consistency wins at this level. And Laurie Heinen has put a foot wrong all weekend yet. He's walked through that first battle. Huge advantage to him. And now he's going to be in the chase position with a lot less pressure. Alfred Greinberg's going to know he's on the ropes now. He has nothing really to do except put in a phenomenal run and hope that Heinen makes a mistake. But I'm not betting on it too soon with Heinen this weekend. No, nor am I, David. I know that Heinen wants this one. He's hungry for it. He's got a lot of Finnish fans. I think he has that in his blood, that Finnish cold stare. It's calculated. It's cool, calm and collected. He sits on that line. He knows what he needs to do, run after run. But now we see him in that chase position. Will he be tested as a chase driver against somebody who may be not as confident on a national championship level going into this first corner, especially after that off? Well, here we go. Lights start to illuminate. He gets the green light. Will be Alfred Groenberg to lead in. Laurie Heinen now through the gears they go. You can see Laurie Heinen matching him pace for pace. Jumps onto the back bumper, looks for the initiation. Laurie Heinen right where with him, but he's going to give him a little bit of room to maneuver now. Grimberg opens up the throttle, starts to drive away. Can he stick to that qualifying line? A little bit of wavering and wobbling. He misses the outside zone now. As Grimberg comes down the hill into that front point, uh, clipping point, 
through the transition. They go high and not doing too much, too drastic here, keeping himself safe, keeping the car within the white lines. As Greinberg goes deep, Lee tying in an almost off circuit across the line. Greinberg done everything he could there to keep himself in the fight. Yeah, and I think Laurie Heinen from the start is watching Greinberg's car saying he's missing zones here. I don't need to be right on him here. He's not, the, Greinberg misses the inside uh, zone uh, straight off the bat. And, and all of a sudden Heinen saying, okay, he's already missing zones. I've got a big advantage from the first run. There's no need to do anything, you know, too drastic. Let's be clever, let's be strategic. Let's just get it on the points. Let's not try and do anything crazy. And Heinen, we know it is the cat and mouse scenario for him. He's holding back about 50% here just to make sure he doesn't make an error to throw it away back the other way. And Greinberg does a good job. We're, we're seeing some of the potential talent that he has to show in the future. But he's got a little bit to learn still as Laurie Heinen, who's right at the top of his game, playing a very strategic game here all the way through the run. You can see Heinen just backing off and saying, I think I've done enough here to take this one. I think this is going to be a pretty easy decision to kick things off for the judges. They ain't going to get it easy for the rest of the competition. No, they certainly aren't, Dave. And uh, we can see some nice slow-mo shots here in the front of Alfred Greinberg's Nissan Turner's X-S14. What I love about Flames it, erupting yeah. from the front and the rear. That's what I love about it is, you know, power is what we yeah. talk about in this championship. You know, if you've less than 800 horsepower, it seems to be you've got a slow, and I'm using air quotes that you can't see, a slow car here. We're going to get a decision from the judges. First one of the weekend It is going to be Laurie Heinehan getting the win. Laurie Heinehan gets the win and goes through to the top 16. No surprise there. Masterclass uh, of how to manage uh, maybe a less experienced opponent there from Laurie Heinehan. He won't get it as easy for the rest of the competition, but he's pretty happy with the fact that he is going to be one of those guys to watch throughout the competition. He looks super strong in Mondello. He proved his point. He came back with another three or 400 horsepower. He said that was the difference maker. Now he's got the machinery. We knew he had the talent. It's a, it's a lethal combination for anybody he's coming up against for the rest of the competition. And from my perspective right now, what I really want to see is him be tested now and see how he, he hangs against some of those top qualifiers, which he's going to meet very quickly because Connor Shanahan will be his opponent in the top 16 because Connor getting that by run. So from that perspective, for me, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how he gets over, how he, how he overcomes that. Yeah, I mean, look, he's, he's going to be tested very quickly. Like you say, he's going to be pushed to the limit straight away. We do have a buy run now. Unfortunately, we heard that news earlier on with Becky and Adam Zalewski. Adam Zalewski suffering valve failure in the cylinder head, um, some damaged valves. So they didn't want to risk the engine. They decided to retire from competition to, you know, there's only four weeks between now and the next event. They didn't want to go all the way back to Poland with a completely dead engine and then have to travel all the way back to Finland. So taking a wise decision, taking it a step sense. back. It makes sense at the moment. Uh, and now we see a buy run from Connor Shanahan, whose team worked tirelessly through the night to repair the head gasket on this car. And this now will be a bit of a confidence booster for Connor Shanahan, throwing that car in, getting a grip back on the car again, feeling it out, making sure it is 110% before he goes head to head with the one and only Laurie Heinemann. Well, it looks so far like there is no issues with that car, and I don't want to curse him with the commentator's curse, but right now, Connor Shannon doing what Connor Shannon does, very technical, always aims to please the judges, does a very you know nice, smooth line around the track. It's got him so many trophies over the years. That car looks to be 100% for me, and I am absolutely so excited to see what happens between Heinehan and Shannon because that's a top 16 battle that's almost staged like a final, a final because if one of those guys goes out in top 16 their championship hopes may be on the rocks so that's going to be very interesting to watch and it's the first battle of our top 16 later on today so it's going to be building up nicely as we go and there's a long way from here to there but for right now we've got Laurie Heinehan and Connor Shannon both into the top 16 but going head to head Certainly do. So there we go. There is the buy run from Connor Shanahan as he makes his way around the circuit. Finishing up that run flawlessly, to be fair, as well. Very, very nice run and kind of shows what we are going to look forward to when we see Shanahan and Heinen go head to head. We have to make it official. Decision drops in onto the screen. It will be Connor Shanahan advancing through to the top 16 later on this afternoon. Then we move it along to a man that I spoke to earlier on in the paddock and he said to me, no practice. The only time I'm going to drive my car is top 32. Dylan Garvey still has a clutch issue. Yeah. Apparently has a very, very specific clutch that nobody has. Mikkel Johansson on the other line, on the other side of the bracket, though, saying, well, my car's now I feel confident because this is my hometown. I feel super confident and I was rocking it yesterday. Yeah, Dylan Garvey has a, a clutch that's completely worn. So they've moved the release very back to allow it to so he can't clutch the car. On the other hand, Mikkel Johansson flying through qualifying and practice. This is going to be a very interesting one. As they come off the line, you can see Johansson in the lead position, fires into that first court to Garvey, though, coming straight in.
in after him. Can't slow down a whole lot, Garvey. Hasn't got the ability of using that clutch, using the left foot break to stay in the ball. Oh, and a late oh. transition for Dylan Garvey. He's going to get himself in trouble here as he wavers and wobbles in the, in the chase position. Johansson missing a couple of zones, but he's very, very fast. Johansson in that lead position, doing a good job of staying out in front. Last corner, Garvey going to try and make a last-ditch effort to get back up onto the door, and he does so successfully. But as you can see, just doesn't have the pace to stay with Johansson across that final outer zone. Uh, it looked like he was struggling a little bit there, Dylan Garvey in the chase position. Gave it a good go on the first corner, but when we came to the transition, got lost a little in the smoke. I think that was Johansson's mistake on the transition, Dave, to be honest with you. You watch this as he comes down, he goes to that outside zone, and then it's a big snappy transition. Well, look, well, boom, puts on too much angle, finds himself on the inside, and that kind of upsets where Dylan Garvey is. From then on out, yeah, the other zone. Garvey then is trying to play catch up, but he's on the wrong line as a chase driver. I'm going to put that fault down to uh, to Mikko Johansson. You know what, Ian? I often, I often say every you, time you, you don't know what you're talking about, but on this particular occasion, I'm going to give you props. He missed two zones. <laughs> yeah. I, I was watching the chase car a little bit more course, than the lead yeah. car just to see where Garvey. Garvey was wobbling, but now that we look back at it, you can see that Johansson misses the outer zone and the inner zone. So the judges are going to be watching that, saying that's the correct qualifying line. And what they talked about in the briefing and in the earlier, you know, explainer of the track is that if you're not running a lead run that's chaseable, no. you're going to be leading points. Of course, yeah. And, and that's going to come down to a lot of it. For, so Mikkel Johansson right now, I don't think he's out of the woods. I, I can see Dylan Garvey there taking a little bit of grace from that battle because of that big mistake. And I think, again, it came into play yesterday in qualifying, dropping a wheel on that uh, second outside zone, upsetting the car, making the driver's transition. We see the onboard from Jack Shanahan. As soon as he hit the wheel, he knew there was no option. He had to transition the car. I agree, and I think from that, you've got you've got mistakes from the lead, you've got mistakes from the chase, and what the judges will be having a little look at is, did the mistakes of the lead cost the mistakes of the chase? Of course. And that's... You know, we have to we watch it. You know, as we see it, you see, oh, Dylan Garvey's nowhere near the lead car. But then you got to look at why. Why? And yep. then that's what the judges are actually looking for. They're not looking at exactly what's on your screens. They're looking at why is this situation happening. That's the technicality they've got to bring to the decision making. So Dylan Garvey and Mike Michael Johansson, we don't know what what way the judges are looking at that. It's now going to come down to the second run. It's going to be very exciting to see who can come through on this. We know Johansson's got the pace to chase Dylan Garvey. We know he can go close. We know he's got to be excellent here. This could be his to win if he can stay to that uh, brightly colored 180SX. Dylan Garvey has no clutch, but however, he can drive this track the way he wants to drive it now because he can use momentum and his left foot braking and accelerating to do that. So this is a real game of chess. I'm looking forward to seeing how this one plays out. Yeah, so am I. I'm looking forward to seeing how Dylan Garvey handles this round here and seeing how Mikko Johansson can keep up. And there we go. Nice initiation from Dylan Garvey. You can see now, no wandering way, but he's flat out on the front. He knows he can't use the clutch. Goes right to the edge of the circuit. Good transition back. Very well timed from Garvey. On the handbrake a little early, though. Now you Johansson starts to fall away. No proximity from Mikko Johansson as he transitions through that outside zone. Tries to catch up now as Garvey looks for that final outside zone, blinded by the smoke of both the driver and the drone as they go to the wall. Johansson slow. No proximity in that one. No, no proximity whatsoever from Johansson from start to finish. And I really thought he had the pace there, especially with, you know, Garvey having sort of... the course so let's see which way the judges go on this one i'm not too sure uh we've watched it ourselves we've made our own decisions but the judges have the final decision and it is going to be the decision for the top 16 spot for either one of these drivers and it is going to be dylan garvey dylan garvey gets the win and goes through to the top 16. quick check in with you kevin uh it looked to me like dylan's lead line was better and johansson just missing a lot of zones 
Yeah, absolutely. For us here in the tower, both of the chase runs uh, weren't really great. None of the drivers really bringing the battle to the other one. So for us, it really does come back down to that lead line that I spoke about at the start, to start of this top 32. We were looking for the drivers to run that qualifying line, and that's exactly what Dylan did. He had a fantastic lead line the whole way throughout. And unfortunately, uh, Johansson, he just uh, wasn't hitting all those zones. He missed uh, zone four, zone five, zone, uh, the edge of zone six, and the edge of zone seven. So if you're not nailing that qualifying line, you're not going to be able to progress through this competition. And even if, with Dylan not having the best of uh, chase runs, he still made it because he was on that qualifying line. There you go. So it goes to show you can be door on door. You can do all the fun stuff that we like to see. But if the lead car is not on those zones, he's hurting. And there you have it. Dylan Garvey would not have believed that he was even going to qualify. And now here he is going into the top 16. It shows to show how unpredictable this event is. Well, talking about believing, Dave, a few weeks ago, Dwayne McKeever would never have believed he would have been in Sweden this weekend if it wasn't for the Irish Drift community getting behind him and supporting him the way they did. And he's on the line. He qualified ninth, but he goes up against a stellar competitor, a man that is stone cold. Eric Gotchow sits on the line right now, staring down the track, sitting alongside debatably one of the greatest European drivers of all time. Yeah, but he wants to be the greatest European driver of all time. You've got to do that by taking down people like Dwayne McKeever. And the youngster, Eric Gotchow, is going to be running in to the back end of that 180SX very quickly here from the start. He's got the pace, but McKeever has also a ton of pace. That's right from the off. McKeever showing that pace, and he has left Gotchow through that first corner. Gotchow's now going to have to start cutting the course here. He's always straightened oh, up wow. a little bit in the middle. Looks like Gotchow's having some issues here as they come down to that first decel zone. McKeever is absolutely flying flying through the course, and Gotchal is desperately trying to get up on the curbs to get close to him, but he can't get close to him, only until the very end by cutting the course. He does force an issue, a little tap of the rear end of Dwayne McKeever's car to remind him that he's there, but how he got there wasn't the correct way. He was jumping through the course. Yeah, he was jumping through the course, Dave. You can see the way he was shortcutting. And look at McKeever on an absolute flyer as he looks for that outside zone, and Gotchal, look at the way he, he poised his body for that initiation. He threw everything into that one. He knew he had to drive away. Gotchal, not a person you want to mess with, he can be deadly on his day, but you can see where he's off of that qualifying line. Shortcut in the circuit, almost completely straight there on that transition. And McKeever is up and gone like a bat out of hell. And Gotcha is staring down the track saying, how is this young man so fast? Well, I think that's what I'm just going to talk about is speed, because we know now with modern drifting, it is about speed. It's about grip. It's about being fast around the track. It's not just making a ton of smoke and a ton of angle. And what's interesting, if you look at the, that run, more so than the mistakes, more so than the, the run itself. You've got to look at Gotchal cutting every single corner on the track in a car with 700 horsepower, and he can't catch McKeever, who's on the correct wide line which goes to show that McKeever, whatever he's done to that car, he has tons of pace in it this weekend. And even one of the most talented up and coming drivers can't catch him if he's straight lining through the corners, which proves to the rest of the grid who will be watching on that McKeever is the man that's probably fastest around here today. He certainly will be. Well, they put him back up to the line now. Eric Gauchel gets to lead out Dwayne McKeever, and he'll know that McKeever won't cut the circuit. He won't need to cut that line. Gauchel needs to throw down the best qualifying run he can. And look at this, McKeever stages himself a little bit off the back bumper, giving himself a little bit more of a run in, although he doesn't need the pace. He wants to keep that momentum as they fire in into that initiation point. They're through the gears, through the chicane. Down they come. McKeever keeps him within eyesight now as he jumps onto the back bumper and dives up onto the door as Gauchel fires that car into that initiation. Down they come through that inner zone and now McKeever flawless on the chase oh, almost missed positions himself though gets it done right though as they come down into that second inside zone through over the hill now McKeever gives him the room to maneuver as he looks for the decel zone McKeever waits for the dive up to the door onto the rear wheel squeezes the throttle up onto the side across the line you know what it almost went really wrong for Dwayne McKeever there he went too aggressive I think that the transition was later than he expected from uh, Eric and when he Eric transitioned, McKeever was like, I got to do this all in a split second. And he did. It shows the experience. It was a little bit of a moment where he just had to kind of figure it out. He <laughs> did. He did a good job on it. But this is watch how close McKeever gets here. And he thinks he's going to transition now. He transitions a little later. And McKeever is edging, edging towards the edge of the track. But he does a good job of keeping it to the zone. And as you can see, a great lead run from Eric Gottschall here, giving McKeever plenty to work with. Uh, star contrast to the chase. However, McKeever does to me 
get the proximity, get close. This transition for me was excellent. I love this part of the track. Just pops through the smoke and then boom, he's back up onto the door. And that's a tricky part. We've seen a lot of drivers make mistakes there, crash into the lead car. You know, it's a it's a big decel zone. It's an unpredictable area of the track. But McKeever to me looked comfortable. And as he went through here, this is where, you know, if you're a judge, you're saying, well, he's got the proximity. He's on the correct line. He's not cutting the course. And McKeever actually wider in some areas than the lead car, which was the opposite of what Eric Gottschall was doing, which was cutting the course. So if I'm uh, sitting with my judging hat on, which is a very crumpled hat because it's not <laughs> actually uh, that important, I would say this one could be another obvious decision. And it looks like it's going to be Dwayne McKeever. Dwayne McKeever gets the win and goes through to the top 16. A yeah, quick check in with you, Kevin. Looked to me like it was the chase run from Gottschall that just kind of sealed the deal for him there. Yeah, for that, it really just comes down to the chase runs. Both drivers having really, really good lead lines, um, so it all came down to the proximity on the chase run. Dwayne was able to relatively stick it to his door with uh, very little corrections or deviations from the line, but unfortunately, Eric uh, was making huge sacrifices due to the pace of Dwayne's car. So for us, it was a, a relatively easy decision there for, for this run. Thanks, Kev. You won't get them so easy right throughout the competition, no. but you know what? We'll give them a break. We'll, we'll ease them in. Um, yeah, it, it's easy to watch sometimes. You can figure it out. One guy's closer than the other car, and then you got to go, how did he get there? Did he get there the right way? And McKeever did. So we move on to a huge battle. Battles that I feel are almost incredible just to say what's happening. We've got the WRC World Rally Champion, Calais Rovenpera, going up against a hometown hero from Sweden, Victor Vetmark. So this is stuff that just never happens. Nope. You know, when, when, when you wake up on a Thursday morning and say, hey, I'm going to do that Driftmasters event. Oh, yeah? Do you think you're going to be sitting there beside the WRC champion in your first ever battle in Driftmasters? Well, that's the stuff dreams are made of. But he wants to turn a dream into a bigger dream of beating him. So let's see what happens when they come off the line. This is going to be an interesting one. It certainly is going to be an interesting one. Full place qualifier. Can I did it all in his second qualifying run through the gears and flicks that big carbon fiber super across the circuit. Victor Vetmark says, well, I have no Nothing at the moment for this one. He might need to shortcut the circuit. Oh, Rover Bearer! Rover shuts, Bearer shuts it down. down. That could be that issue with the manifold creeping back in again. Wow. But to me, did it die of power? There's definitely an issue with Rover Bearer's car. The smoke coming from, from the, the front of the car, not the rear of the car, which to me would indicate he's got a major issue there. And just when you think you've seen it all in drifting, an unknown rookie from Sweden may just take down the World Rally Champion here in the middle of the top 32. Can't take your eyes off this championship, Ian. Well, let's what happened? Let's look, look at yeah. the front of the car, not the rear of the car. All of a sudden, he's coming through. The, he's got a great line. Everything's going great. And then all of a sudden, the power just stops instantly on Rova Perez's car. And he tries to reinitiate. So he's using momentum on the handbrake here. He goes back on power again. He's got a little bit of power there, and it moves on again. He would have got a zero for me at this point anyway. And then again, shuts down. Watch the smoke just start pour from the front of the car here a little bit on the uh, driver's side. Passenger on, Passenger this, on this one, yeah. So there you go. See the front, just the front wheel arch, just smoke puffing out there. That doesn't look good to me. And we've got recovery on the track now. We've got Roman Perez's car coming to an almost standstill. That to me would suggest we've got bigger issues here. And in Drift Masters, if you can't get back to the start line within five minutes and go back into your second run, you're eliminated from the competition. And right now, to me, the body language would suggest that the smoke pouring from the car, Roman Perez exiting the car, would indicate that there's a bigger problem here and maybe even a fire, a small fire in that car. I think there is a fire in that car and our safety marshal down there, Marcia, uh, sorry, um, Maciek Polody down there trying to work out what the issue is. We, we have a fire, exactly. it's, in, it's actually in the cabin, it looks like it's at the bottom of the cabin, there is a small fire and you can see the, the, the actual cabin filling with smoke slightly here as uh, our safety marshals make sure that that is uh, out, but to me, it, not only will the fire be put out, but it looks like it'll be the ambitions of Cali Rova Perez this weekend because there is no way of recovering from this unless it's a very simple problem, but um, I'm wondering that Roman Perez shut it down because of the fire within the car. Was it a, a, a malfunction in the car? We have no idea, but I will say one thing. As a professional racing driver, he's going to be very quick to know what's going on here. Yeah, look, and, it, and he's very technical, you know. WRC drivers renowned for knowing their car inside and out and what they need technically uh, and mechanically to work. And Cali Roman Perez, um, you know, been around a long time. His father, a renowned rally driver as well. So he will know this car inside out, not only as a driver, but as a, as a mechanic. And he'll be able to pinpoint what exactly it needs and I wonder what exactly has gone on here. 
Well, I mean, you can imagine the emotional roller coaster that Victor Vetmark went through. Initiated, he's gone. Roman Perez gone. He's sitting there, he's all dejected. He's like, hey, I'm never going to catch this guy. Then all of a sudden, he sees Roman Perez's car shut down in front of him. And all of a sudden, he's like, hold on a minute, I got a chance here. So, you know, this is the unpredictable nature of drifting. And, and I think Roman Perez even summed it up himself very, very good in the, in the, in the pre show with Becky because he said, drifting is very different than other motorsports because one tiny error or one mechanical failure and you're gone from the weekend. Whereas you. You have a, a, a lot of options in other motorsports. It uh, looks to me, Becky, like that is the end of his weekend because something has gone very wrong for Cali down there. Absolutely, Dave. Uh, I think it is the end of his weekend. I'm very sorry to see this, Cali. Everything was looking so strong there. And then the car, you shut it down yourself after the run? No, because uh, already through the first corner, I lost all the power. I think uh, the guys tried to mix the, uh, fix the manifold, but the whole, I think, pipe uh, came off. So I lost all the power and almost the car got on fire. So luckily it didn't. Uh, big thanks to, to my team for trying to fix it. Um, they did everything they could. Yeah, I mean, it's an unfortunate start to your season, but it's a very strong first showing for you. Let's talk about next round. We're going to Finland, we're going to the Power Park. Have you driven there before? I haven't been there before. It's a new track, so of course it's going to be exciting. I hope to see all the Finnish people there and everybody else also. You have huge, huge support out here from the Finnish fans. There are so many of them sitting on the grandstand. Would you like to say anything in Finnish to them? Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for all the fans. We still have uh, strong Finnish drivers on the race, so I hope all the best for them. And uh, hopefully they will uh, keep the Finnish flag high. We couldn't today, but next time we will. Excellent. Thank you, Kale. Thanks, Becky, and you could see the incredible scenes as he was driving through the track, so calm and collected, he couldn't see it, but the car was on fire. There was yeah. flames licking down behind that carbon fiber dashboard. Check the right of your screens right now. As he's driving through, the flames licking through the car, so that's obviously a backfire from the manifold or something coming loose, igniting whatever may be in that. It could be wiring, it could be anything in that particular area of the car, um, but a scary moment that luckily didn't go any worse, but to me, it, it is the end of his weekend, and we're gonna see uh, our next driver, which to me, Victor Vetmark, is going to be doing a run on his own. Yeah, he, would, he wouldn't have said this might be the toughest challenge of his drift career, and it turned out to be a totally different uh, situation. And as you can see, one of the heroes of our of our <laughs> motorsport here. Well, John, you'll be happy anyway. Johnny though. Scoops is back out again to scoop the car up. Uh, oh, Jesus. oh, he might want to put the brakes on there, Cali. Uh, as oh. the scooper comes out, Johnny Scoops to take the car away. Um, this guy, he's a, you should see this guy at a pick and mix. He's just unbelievable. He, he, <laughs> he's, he's sensational. You can still see the smoke, smoke yeah. just licking from where they've extinguished. It could be fire extinguisher residue that's left on the car. But uh, Rovan Perra will talk to all of you as if, you know, this is okay, this is fine. But he's going to be very dejected there. Very competitive young man. And he wants to win everything. He's disappointed with any result that isn't top step. So he's going to be annoyed that this has happened. But it's going to, you know, it's going to make him even more hungry for the next round, I think. He certainly is. It's going to make him hungry. Look, we're going to his home ground, Dave, in just a few weeks' time. To say he's going to have a bit of support is an understatement. I think, yes, probably the most successful <laughs> current Finnish motorsport superstar yep. is going to Finland with a bunch of other very popular Finnish drivers to compete in Finland. I think he'll have a little bit of support. I think, I the, think atmosphere, the atmosphere might just be <laughs> electric fe fever pitch, I think, <laughs> will probably be the right word. But we're going to see a, a by run now from, uh, from Victor Vietmark. He, he just has to make a pass to the circuit here. I mean, stranger things have happened, but I'm pretty sure if he just gets around the course here, he's going to beat the current WRC rally champion. He can tell everybody uh, during the week that he's beaten them. He, that he won't explain why. No, he'll just, just, just say, oh, yeah, you know, just beat the WRC rally champion there. Um, and why did his car break him? Nah, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so he's going to put in a nice run. I mean, I love this. Look at the style on the roof of the car. It's got that, uh, that sort of old low rider esque yeah. paint. It's a beautiful car, lots of style. Um, and he's, he's just going to drive off, off the, the track, track a little yeah. bit, um, which is probably not what he wants to be doing. Um, so uh, I said, the thing about it is, these, sometimes these by runs can be a challenge because you have no pressure, but at the same time, you're going, I don't want to push too hard. And you almost overthink it. Yep. And I think that's what happened there. But uh, we were speaking to Kevin O'Connell, our judge. Uh,
Daniels. Gets us closer to the action than ever before, thanks to Red Bull TV. And then we've got a decision to be made from our judges of who is going through to our top 16. And it looks to me like it's going to be Kuba Pishkonski going through. Kuba goes through to our top 16. Going to throw back up to Kevin O'Connell. Kevin, my old friend, looked like both of these guys made mistakes in the chase. Where did you see that decision coming from? Uh, lots of mistakes by both drivers and both runs, actually, Dave. Uh, to go back to the first run first, uh, Kuba had a pretty good lead line and unfortunately Karakashi just making a lot of mistakes especially a good big straighten at uh, outer zone 7 and another small straighten at just before the finish line where he was gaining proximity uh, so there was a fairly significant advantage to Kuba going into the second run then you switch him around and I suppose the talking point for that run is obviously the error by Kuba um, in the chase run between outer zone 3 and outer zone 4 initially when we looked at that we thought oh yeah Kuba's after coming offline making a big error and checking up but if you look back in the replay, Karkoshik was actually way offline at Outer Zone 3, that qualifying line that we're constantly talking about here. And that made his transition very difficult all the way down to Outer Zone 4. And he de decelerated about 5-6 metres before Outer Zone 4, which, as I said in the briefing this morning, was a major deduction. So Kuba, unfortunately, had nowhere to go because of that poor transition by Karkoshik, and that is what caused Kuba's error. So we deemed him at fault there, and therefore Kuba had an advantage for the second run too in taking the win overall. You know what? He makes perfect sense. Makes sense now. Makes sense. When you look back, you go, yeah, I didn't notice that. But that is true. He did make a, an error in the lead, Karkoshik, and that caused a big mistake for Pushkonski. And here we are. Kuba goes through. On to our next battle. Here's an interesting one. Italy versus Kuwait. Classic drift battle here. Classic. <laughs> okay, you get this in motorsport all the time. All the time. <laughs> all the time. All the time. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I would love to know how many times Kuwait and Italy have played each other in any motorsport or any sport in <laughs> or general. any sport in general, yeah. But here we go. It is going to be Manuel Vaca in the E36 going up against a borrowed car for Ali Makhshid. He is a Kuwait a drifter, but he's also had trophies all over the Middle East. This is his first ever battle in Drift Masters. This is going to be interesting. Not the first battle for Manuel Vaca, but the first that he's been looking as strong as he has this weekend. And they go to the first corner. They go to the next Ali Makhshid right up onto the door. But he oh. loses his power or steering or something happens there for Ali Makhshid. It looked like he was in the right place. But he made an error, and as they come down the hill, it looks like Ali Marchi's struggling a little bit to stay on the inside of the course. Manuel Vaca missing that inner zone a little bit, but he's flying Manuel Vaca as he goes through the entire second half of the course. Nearly too fast as he transitions back. It's a little scrappy from both of these guys as they come through. Ali Marchi getting the last gasp effort up onto the door. But it looked to me like the big error was the first corner for Ali Marchi. I'm not sure if he had understeer issues or what happened or the car shut down, but uh, the Italian flag definitely being waved uh, high in the grandstands. What happened to Ali Makhshid here? So he initiates, everything looks fabulous. Unbelievable, everything's going great. Watch the front wheel all of a sudden. Ah, oh, that looks like a shutdown of power to me or, or some sort of issue with the car because he's on full throttle and all of a sudden he's got, yeah, rear wheel's not spinning, has to reinitiate. Yeah. Something went wrong with the car there and that's so unfortunate for Ali Makhshid. It looked to me like it wasn't a uh, driver from where I'm sitting anyway, which is very far away because everything's very far away. I was just going to say, we're but a long way away. <laughs> we get to sit very close with the Red Bull TV cameras inside the cars, and it looked to me like Manuel Vaca from that point on, Ali Makhshid's playing catch up. He's cutting the course as best he can to get back into the battle, but I don't know, Manuel Vaca looks stronger to me over the run. No big major errors, a couple of wobbles off the line, but nothing too, uh, too drastic. I think uh, Vaca has been looking strong this weekend, Ian. He has been looking strong, and I think this is one of the tracks where he feels confident, Dave. You know, that was high speed. Um, you know, big poles, long corners suit his style, and uh, I think he feels very confident. I think if it wasn't for the issue with the car, Ali Maxi could have been there with him door to door all the way because he had that initiation. He knew where he was going to be, he was setting the car up to be on the door all the way through the initiation of those first two outside zones. But unfortunately, that little issue caused him the understeer and he had to reinitiate, and it played in once again into hand right in front of the grandstand outside zone six. Um, judges would have been seeing that as well. Yeah, it, it looked to me like there was just a shut off of power. And I mean, if you're driving at what? There were clocking drivers there at 120 miles an hour yep. through the course today. Think about that just for a minute. Yeah, that's pretty fast. It's very fast. <laughs> that's over motorway over speed. Over 100 miles an hour. And then your wheels are going faster than that because obviously they're spinning yep. at that point. So you're not only driving at that speed, you're spinning the wheels at that speed. 
Yeah, it's hard to get your head around. I'm not sure if physics even comes into play here <laughs> at all because it makes no sense. But that's when you're having a shut off of power at that speed. It's scary stuff. Does well to come back around, not spin the car, go off the track, watch, which we watch a lot of drivers do in practice. They certainly do. So here we go, back on the line we go. Ali Maxid now to lead out Manuel Vaca. Manuel Vaca looking confident. Can Ali Maxid to this head turn of the the team hold together that turbo V8 underneath the body? Big initiation from Ali Maxid. Now he tries to drive away. No problems whatsoever this time, though, as he absolutely fires down. But Vaca's with him on the back bumper. Transitions at the same time. Oh, Vaca almost over rotates, puts too much angle into it. But Maxid on the wrong line misses that inside zone. Oh, and now Vaca shuts it down and drives the rest of the circuit. <laughs> a car can't seem to get through this track without having an issue, and that to me now brings it back to the Ali Maxid error from the first run of it being a zero or not a zero because it was a, a, only a momentary shutdown. Well, or is it going to be a one more time? Because to me, it looks like an incomplete from Manuel Vaca on his well, no, it looks like it is an incomplete, it really is an incomplete. yeah. And, I mean, and, and, and Ali Maxid did complete his run, but did he zero out his run? So, I, oh. to be honest, I think it will come down to whether they count, yeah, Max Seed's straightenings as a zero. They were only mo momentary, like you say. It wasn't a prolonged amount of straightening. But we're not judges, we are just mere malls fans of this sport. And uh, this was a big shutdown. Look, the car completely lost power and... Um, well, he's, yeah, he's zero that. He's out of control, so, so, yeah. yeah he's, he's, he's got an issue and you can see it straight away. He's on the clutch, look, trying to, trying to kick the clutch. He's down through the gearbox. Something's gone very, yeah, oh, something's gone very wrong. Yeah, look, he's... So Alec McSheed does finish both runs. However, he has a big error on his first run, which the judges will have a look at and see, is it enough for a zero? If it is a zero, I mean, I'm going to put it out there and say, and then there could be a retire. No, is there a retirement for Manuel Vaca? I don't know. There's a lot going on here. I'm going to try and figure it out like you guys are at home. But for me, it'll going to come down to whether or not there's a zero or not for Ali Machida on the first one. We're going to know that by the decision. And we know it by the decision because it's a one more time. So, Kevin, we were just checking out. You have zeroed Ali Machida from the first run, allowing him to balance off the incomplete from Manuel Vaca and cause it one more time. Are we on the money there? You guys are finally on the money. Yes, finally, you're correct. Finally. <laughs> yes, you're correct. Look, uh, per our criteria, if you stop drifting for a period of time, then we deem that as an incomplete. Unfortunately, Ali had a, a good two to three seconds of actually stop drifting and then, then had to reinitiate. So we deemed that to be an incomplete on our end here. And obviously, then on the second run, then Vaca had an incomplete too as well. So that's a double incomplete on their chase runs. Both lead runs fairly similar, so we weren't able to differentiate a winner on that. So therefore, it has to go one more time. Well, there you go. So, it, you know, we, we might have got one thing right this weekend, Ian. We one saw thing. We're getting there. You know, you know, and, and Kev's, 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 Kev's ice cold look at us then through the yeah. camera into the monitor was like, you're I feel like I feel like we there. cause a lot of shaking of heads from the judges at times for what we say, but I we're think, trying. I think they do what Manuel Vaca did. I think when we say something, they throw their hands in the yeah. air like, do these guys not understand yet? But we understand that it's one more time. And you know what? I think Ali McShee will take that. He'll know he had a huge error on the on his, you know, chase run. So he's got another chance at that. So um, Matt Vaca is going to have to figure out that problem. But we move on to a huge battle for the championship. Interesting. Very interesting, a very big battle because Peter Vianzek, every time he goes out on this track, it's a big battle for the championship because he is the man that has been unstoppable for the last two years and the first round of this competition. He has looked like a man possessed for the last couple of years. No one's really been able to punch as high as him. And now he's in the top 32. And out in the top 32 would be a disaster for Vianzek, but also for Alex Holovnia. Huge statement here if he could take down the pound for pound best in Europe right now. This may be a top 32 battle, but both of these guys will definitely be treating this like a final because Halavia knows he's up against a guy he probably would also meet in the final so he's going to lose this if he doesn't go all out there's no easy battle here and Vianzek goes I lose it here everyone's going to find a lot of points on it so this is a very very stressful battle for both of these guys and we get to see it play out right now we certainly do through the chicane through the gears comes Vincek chased down by Alex Halivia right now as they fire in Halivia already starting to lose ground as they come firing through that first inside zone Halivia though starts to rein it back opens up the throttle goes for the transition both down the hill this is very nice from both guys at the moment. A little bit of separation. Halivnia would like to be a, a little closer now, but he's shortcut in the circuit. He wants to make a big dive on that final corner, and he goes for it as he goes for wheel-to-wheel -wheel action against the champion across the line. Yeah, and again, it's going to come back to, you might have been close, but how did you get there? And how you got there by...
I think, I think you're, you're right there, Dave. He does have the pace. But we will maybe see those head-to-head -head at some point this weekend in competition. But well, they're back on the line. Halivnia now to lead out Vincek. And Vincek knows all he has to do is keep that proximity, not make any mistakes in that chase and stick it door to door. And that is what he is an absolute master of. We get the green light. They're through the gears. Halivnia absolutely lights the tyres up already on the F22 BMW. Hops a wheel off the tarmac as he flicks it across the circuit through the initiation. Vincek's right with him. He knows he can't get lost in the smoke. He needs to keep on the door, and he does. He tucks that 15 right onto the back bumper, onto the door, down the hill they come. But the lead line from Halivnia at the moment is absolutely incredible. Goes for the transition, but Vincek's there, the door is open, and Halivnia is giving him the opportunity to chase perfectly as he fires into the final outside zone. Vincek on the inside, but he makes it work as he pushes on the rear wheel and turns him around. Now, that's the question. That's the question. Who is at fault? Did Olivia go on too much angle or did Vyansek spin him or was there a slowdown from Olivia? I'm not making any claims that happened too fast, <laughs> but that is not as clear cut as we thought. I was just about to say at this moment, before they got into that last wall run, that next year when we're doing the briefing, show this lead show and this, this. chase, because yeah. that was absolutely incredible from both of these guys. Now Vyansek backs off a little bit there and this is where it's all going to come down to. Olivia is on power on the wide line as they go out to the edge of the track. Vyansek's catching. And he hits the oh front wheel. Oh my god! He hits the front wheel of Halovnia's car. But does Halovnia slow? Is that that's what they're doing? Well, the only way we're going to see is on top of the windscreen, Dave, for you guys watching at home. If you've not watched it before, we have a, an LED brake light to indicate on the top of the windscreen, front and rear, to show whether they're braking. He wasn't braking when he was hit. And from my perspective, he looked like he was on full he throttle. He was on full throttle, yeah. Me. So let's just have a look again. He's on the right, right line. Halovnia is where he needs to be. Vyansek is climbing down the inside and he jumps forward. Vyansek hits the front wheel. Now, if he hits he the door, he hits the rear quarter, he hits the rear wheel. Wheel, we got a debate on our hands, but front wheel to front wheel, Look generally... At the top of the windscreen. Look, yep. top of the windscreen, no light. There's no braking for, from for, Lovia. For me, Dave, what was astonishing was the way that the car of Vinsec suddenly gripped up and drove forward. Yep. Now, I'm going to go back to a point that you made yesterday about the amount of rubber on that final outside zone. Did Vinsec's car all of a sudden grip up and drive forward. Because he was on the inside line. Because he was on the inside line and the car just drove at Holovnia and there was nothing that Vincent could do to slow it down. Well, it definitely wasn't intentional. No. Holovnia's spun. So it's going to be this. Now, this could very easily go oh, back. Oh, now we've got a fire on um, Holovnia's car as well. What in the name of God is happening in this championship <laughs> right now? I don't know anymore. I try and be an expert and bring me all this randomness. Can we randomness. do a rebrand for next year? Can we call it Drama Masters? Drama Masters, because yeah. I have no... I, I know, look at Vinesek's face. He doesn't know. He doesn't know which way the judges are going to go here. Now, we've, we've, we've assigned fault. However, the judges are... are as fans. As fans. As fans. Thus, we can't make we any can't decisions. We can't make any decisions. The judges have looked at that very, very carefully. They also have and they don't always show it, much more camera angles than we have. They have the onboard of both drivers. They have got more camera angles yep. from both drivers. So they're analyzing it, and I can, I can hear through the floor, because there are a, a floor big above discussion. us, a big argument going on right now on this one. And it looks to me like we've got a small fire in Halovnia's car, or a leak of some sort. Did it shut down? I, did it shut down? Did something happen? I mean, did the car shut off across the finish line? That could have been what happened, Ian. We couldn't hear it at the time. But we're going to get I, Becky Evans down there, because there's one person that can find I, out this for us. Becky, what? happened on that last corner does anybody know Dave I'm not entirely sure if anybody knows right now what happened on that last corner I'm gonna have a little chat with uh, Alex here your car seems to be uh, leaking a little bit is there is, is it your fire system that's just managed no, no, to pop no, no. off this quick wash after my top surgical <laughs> what happened this quick wash oh. this quick wash yeah <laughs> There's no problem this car. Just quick wash after that. I mean, you know, that's exactly what you need. Um, can you t can you walk us through those last final five seconds there? Because everything was looking lovely and smooth. Your lead line was lovely. And then what happened? First and second run, I uh, use full throttle and then don't have tires for the last uh, corner. No tires. OK, so it was a case of you'd run out of grip and it was just turning, turning. OK, it's not your season this year, is it? It's a little bit difficult season for me, yeah. <laughs> but at least you're still smiling. Unfortunately, I mean, this is probably going to take a few minutes to clean up. But is your car, your car is OK, though? I don't know. OK, fine. I mean, engine wash. Engine wash, he says. So far, that's so, so far so good. Let's have a little chat with Peter. Peter, how are you? You're looking a little bit uh, nervous right now. Yeah, everybody loves top 32, huh? Um, uh, but yeah, it was a lot, a lot happened during that run. I thought that uh, it was okay till the, the very last moment when 
Um, I don't know if I attack too much or he slows down a bit, but uh, I don't know, it's in judges' hands right now, honestly. After watching the cars after, it doesn't look like it was the cleanest one, but uh, it is what it is. Um, I felt like he slowed down a bit. I have also not uh, enough angle to um, not crash into him, but we both managed to, to cross the line a bit more sideways than we would like to, but <laughs> it is what it is. It was a good fun and uh, we'll see how it's going to go through. Okay, well, the judging decision has dropped in, so I'm going to throw it back to you guys. Thanks, Becky. Well, we have absolutely no idea what way the judge is going to go. We, we looked at the, the, the explanation from both guys there. It looked like there was tire issues for Halavnia. Vyansek saying he might have attacked too much or did he slow down too much? We don't know. The judges have had a very long conversation on this. They've also had to make a decision. So who is going to go through to the top 16? And it is going to be... A split decision, but it's Alex Holovnia getting the decision. Alex Holovnia gets the decision and goes through to the top 16 championship blown wide open here in Sweden. And Kevin, I'm going up to you. You guys are having some arguments. Talk us through what way that split decision has gone. Yeah, very heated in the tower up here, just to trying to make that decision because that was a very, very tough one. So what we had to look at is, is the lead driver fulfilling his, his lead goals and is the chase driver fulfilling his lead goals? So basically what we looked at, Alex, yes, he had to have a drop off at a, a one wheel off on the start of the outer zone, but he got back onto his line at outer zone eight then for the remainder of it. So for us, um, he was fulfilling his zones. Yes, maybe he was running out of tires and he was uh, getting a little bit slower towards the end of that uh, zone, but but in my opinion, he didn't do enough to actually warrant um, impeding the chase driver. However, when you look at Peter, he had a huge dive coming into the start of outer zone eight, and he had to shallow up angle and come way off the qualifying line to maintain that proximity with Alex. And therefore, in my opinion, then that's what caused the contact with the front wheel of Alex and therefore spun Alex going out over the finish line. So we deemed it to be Peter's fault overall because he was the one that caused the contact. I can see it, Kev, I can see it on the replay, and it makes perfect sense, and wow, we've had, you know, we've had an uppercomer from Sweden beat the World Rally Champion, we've had Connor Shannon, who had an engine failure yesterday, beat Zalewski, who had an engine failure, and now we've had Peter Vjainsek out in the top 32, and you're going to try and make any sense of this championship? Well, right now in the pits, a man that rolled his car twice is trying to get back out for a battle. Ian, we're not even at the halfway point to the top 32, and this has all happened already. What do we think that Oren Nielsen can get this car ready. He's got probably got about he's 10, got, 15 yeah, minutes. Yeah, he's got about, well, he's probably got a little bit longer than that. We've got one, two, three, four battles to go before Oren Nielsen is required to be at the line. And then there is five minutes before we send uh, the other car. Oh, here Look we go, watch this. You can, see, you can just go. see it through the smoke. He's behind Nakamura in practice. The car rolls oh, twice wow. and lands back on its wheels. Oren Nielsen, we had some images, you know, I watched some of the photographer's hands, you know, on you his head. You can just see through the smoke. Watch the car over and then over, over again. again, boom, and it lands back on its wheels. He has rolled the car twice. They've had to cut a brand new windscreen for it. They've had to no, replace... No, I, I had a rumor in my ears uh, just a few moments ago saying that the track owner knew somebody in Sweden with a Lexan windscreen for a Sora. Oh, come so on. So he drove and collected it for him. The track owner... The track owner. ...drove to collect a Lexan windscreen. That is the rumour. I'm repeating it because I'm trying to understand you're it. You're trying to get it in your head as well. But now, it looks like to me, from my technical um, experience, Dave, that they have an issue maybe with the plug on the electric throttle body, where, which did make contact with the ground. So from, from what I can see there, there's a few guys trying to maybe repin that plug to get the electric throttle body working again. But he's in the car ready to go, which says to me, everything else on the car is good to go. It was checked by our safety marshal. Uh, Maciek Polody, and he said, look, it may look a little yeah. battered and bruised, but technically the roll cage is safe, it has a windscreen, it has a few body panels left, and but then, it is ready to rock and roll. Yeah, and from my non-technical point of view, yep, hit when, us the with top, it. when the top of the engine hits the ground, bad time. Yeah, not good. <laughs> not not good. good. We've been waiting for this one, though. We've been waiting for this battle to happen. Oh, no, Oliver, Oliver Randalou, he finished second step on the podium at round one last year. Since then, not really made a note, not really done any notions in the championship. This season, we announced this man 
coming to Driftmasters. Yep. Nakamura steps up to the plate to take on the best in Europe. He and has the... engine failure at round one. Mm -hmm. They rebuild an engine, he gets on the line, and in practice, he was deadly. What can he do, Dave? Well, in practice, he hit everybody. So let's see what happens to Oliver Randall. Oliver Randall's trying to run away right now because Nakamura is coming from him. As they go into that first corner, Randall with a lot of pace for that first corner. Nakamura stuck a little bit in the smoke, but starting to gain ground now. This is where Nakamura can be deadly in that chase position. Great proximity so far, but a little wobble as both drivers come down the track, and Nakamura is trying not to be too aggressive right now, but he's losing a bit of ground, a little bit of straight line. It doesn't look like he has the pace for Oliver Randall, but randall has gone way wide here and made an absolute mess of that transition, allowing Nakamura back into the fight towards the end. I'm putting my notes, I'm tearing them up, I'm throwing them out the window. I don't know anything about drifting anymore because Nakamura got left for dead by Oliver Randalou, and then Randalou, who's usually ice cold, makes a mistake towards the end. I can't figure anything out. I can't even work it out. Look at this, though, from Nakamura. Does an incredible job. The way he leans over, he's like leaning into it like a motorcycle rider taking a bend at 200 miles an hour. He's not messing around, using the handbrake to adjust the car, waits for the transition. The snap of the transition for me showed, look, boom, he wanted to make a dive, but Randall, who stood on the accelerator, drove away, was one just-ish wheel over the outside zone. But this is where he but makes the mistake. This, yeah. yeah, this is the mistake. mistake. So randall has got all the pace in the world, and he's, he's doing a great job. But watch this. Gets a little too wide for me here, right to the edge of the circuit. That's not where you want to be transitioning, and it makes it awkward, but it allows Nakamura back into the fight. That's a mistake from Randall, but there wasn't too much wrong with the first half of the course. This one is right on the wire. It is certainly right on the wire. And uh, now Oliver Randall will be knowing, hey, look, yeah, you're, you're still in the fight. There was no real big proximity there from Nakamura, but Nakamura, again, not really putting a foot wrong, to be honest. There wasn't a whole load of mistakes. No, and I love his driving style, because it's so old school, the one hand on the steering one wheel. Hand, yeah. It's just, you know, it, it, this is, Japanese drifting 101 with yep. Nakamura, but it's amazing to see it now stack up against the European drifting, and this is the first time we're seeing Nakamura in a battle. And you know what? We've watched him in practice. He probably was a little overly aggressive. He, no. he tagged the... Well, <laughs> he sent Kevin Piscalzi to the moon halfway through the run. He, he smashed into him, but he was learning his, his moments to dive, and I think he may be a little overcautious against Oliver Randalou there. However, Randalou was so fast, it actually cost him towards the end of the run. I think this one is quite even. Big mistake from Randalou, not massive proximity from Nakamura. Let's see what happens on the second run. Nakamura now in the lead position is going to have to use that, that all-out angle style that he uses. Not an easy track to do it here. There's not a huge amount of places to have a lot of flair here. And Randalou, well, he has an unknown entity going up into that first corner. He has no idea what to expect, but he's going for it. No, he certainly is going for it. He looked for the back bumper. He jumps up on the inside. Oh, contact! Randalou smashes into the side of Nakamura, and Nakamura stays in it, flicks the car across the circuit, the bumper hanging down. Can he upset the car? Will it upset the car? He keeps himself in it right now. Randall, who fires off circuit, forget everything you know about drifting because none of it makes sense anymore. Nakamura fires into that final outside zone. Randall, who goes for the door, he wants to stay in it. He pushes Nakamura across the line. Yeah, there yeah. we are. There we are again. Yeah, just yeah. Yeah, yeah. What? 120 mile an hour. Uh, hey, hey, buddy. How you doing? Hey. Smashed into the side of him. He Randall initiated it. way late. And Randall is on very little throttle. Watch, he's gripping up. Oh, that looks to me like Randall is trying to get super close, but he goes too fast. Um, Randall's off, so watch how much grip he has in the back there. He's barely spinning the wheels. Nakamura gets a thump, and then the, the bumper now starts to affect the steering, but he stays in. This is going to hurt when he... Watch, here we go. Do, 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 just driving along, minding my own business, and then bang. Oh, what happened there? And he has a little look across and goes, hey, buddy, relax. There's <laughs> loads of track left to go. Um, and then they stay in it for some reason. And then Randall is like, I don't know what's going on anymore. And then he drives behind. He gets caught in the smoke here. So as he comes through this corner, he goes, oh, no, there's the edge of the track. I'm way off. And that looks to me like he's two wheels. That's into four the... wheels, Dave. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to say it's it. It's four wheels over. But what, I, what I'm noticing from the judges saying two wheels in the grass, is a zero. Yep. And that's definitely two wheels in the grass. I mean, everyone in the grandstand will agree with you that there was definitely yeah. two wheels in the grass. Because most of that grass is now on the on people the grand in stand, the grandstand yeah. at this point. So, yeah, and, and that splitter holding on for dear life on the front of that first car going, I'd love to just be a f about a two inch higher here. It would yeah. be lovely for me, not right here on the ground. And then Randall, who comes back again and says, I'm still here, and takes a few more hits. Yeah, and he starts to the hitting Nakamura's car. I mean, <laughs> Poor Nakamura, he's yeah, like, poor hey, Nakamura, hey, like, hey. Okay, okay. He's like, okay, <laughs> get I, I get it. You're close. I get it. Uh, a taste of his own medicine a little bit there a for Nakamura. Bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> uh, but the amazing thing I, is that he kept going. He, yeah. he kind of continued to run. So for me, it looks like that it's not an incomplete from either driver on the first run, and it's an incomplete from Randall on the, on second, the second, unless 
we see some sort of slowing from Nakamura on the first corner. But the result is going to tell us all here as it drops in for a place in the top 16. It's going to be Naoki Nakamura getting the win and going through to the top 16. Nakamura gets the win. He's confused. Uh, we're confused after the last 14 battles here because we have no idea. It's one of those days. And Nakamura goes through to the top 16. He looks at the car and says, <laughs> it's OK. Everything's fine. It's fine. We're going to go into top 16. It's OK. It's fine. Everything's good. So we have got Nakamura into our uh, top 16, which he would have assumed would he go up against Peter Vjancek. But no, he's gone up against Alex Holovnia, which is big for the championship. So uh, Nakamura moves on. Uh, Kevin, just go quickly back to you for a moment, just to say that uh, from my perspective that it, it was there no slowing from Nakamura in that first corner. You thought that was just a clean hit from uh, Rand Lou and a mistake from him. It's a little bit hard to different to tell, to be honest. Uh, Nakamura definitely didn't have full throttle on at that uh, first corner. He was definitely lifting a little bit. But uh, I guess Randalou kind of made the decision easier for us because he ended up putting two wheels off later on in the run anyway. So while it wasn't an incomplete there, it definitely was an incomplete at Outer Zone 6 when Randalou put two wheels off. So thankfully for us, I guess he made it an easy decision because that was going to be a quite a difficult one to differentiate between. I can imagine, Kev, because because, yeah, it was a little slowing from Nakamura, a little bit too aggressive from, and that's the worst decision for any judge. Who was too fast or who was too slow in those collisions? And yeah. they're always tough to know. We move it on to the one more time between Manuel Vaca from Italy and Ali Makshid from Kuwait. I mean, take your bets, folks, because at this stage, anything's possible. And Ali Makshid and Manuel Vaca, both decorated champions in their own nations. Well, now they come to the big leagues, to Drift Masters, and they go head to head for a spot in the top 16. Kuba Pashkonski awaits the winner. Uh, we had a shutdown, sort of, from Ali Makshid. It, was, it looked like a car issue to me. If he can get past that corner without any issues with the car, it would have taken that first run. But then Manuel Vaca had an issue with the car. Can we see any of these cars just finish the run and a clean decision made? Well, we're about to find out. Well, hopefully we can. This is a test bed for Ali Makshid. He wants to make a program for 2024, and this would be sweetening the deal. If he can get through to the top 16, he tucks the nose onto the door of Manuel Vaca. Look at this, door to door, as Ali Makshid now proves who he is as he transitions down, he looks for the outside zone, gives him the room to manoeuvre. As Manuel Vaca looks to pick up that inside zone, some big ground separated though now. As Ali Maxi once again looks for the throttle, leaves the outside zone early, dives across the circuit, needs to make a big push up onto the door, and he goes for it as Manuel Vaca finishes up the run. Well, we've no incompletes. That's a good no, start. That's a good start. Um, but not the cleanest from from anyone there. Uh, to me, it looked like Max Sheet comes in very hot. He's got great proximity to that first corner. But it's hard to know with both of these guys if, if, if what the. I mean, look at Max Sheet here. That's where you want to be. That's the perfect spot. But as they try to see back, it just barely glances that outer zone. It wasn't perfect. And then Max Sheet kind of gets left for dead a little bit, and he's in the smoke screen. So he jumps on the inside, a little bit of left foot break, and at this point, he's way off the inside zone. So if you're the chase car, you want to be on the inside side of that corner, cutting the, the gap between the lead car. He's on the outside, which causes all this mess in the middle where he has to kind of dive through the course. No such issues for Vaca. Is it the perfect lead run? Bit of too much slowing for me into that last corner, he, but it didn't really affect Max Sheet. In fact, it helped Max Sheet get back into the, the argument a little bit. Not perfect from either driver, but definitely cleaner than the first uh, set of battles between these two guys, but Vaca dropping a wheel there as well. Um, Oh, it's been a very interesting top 32. We're, we're, our brains are working overtime here, guys. <laughs> um, and everything unpredictable has happened. I think it's it's been a strange event so far, and it's only going to get stranger, I think. You don't want to take your eyes off it because you're not too sure. I mean, if we see current champion and points leader, Peter Feinstein, out in top 32, all of a sudden, you've got Laurie Heinen's head pop up. Well, he's in the top 16, so he's you've already got Connor Shanahan pop back. up. Jack Shanahan pop up. Dwayne McKeever pop up. They're like mirror cats in the pits, just all popping up going, excuse me? Peter Fjernsik went out top 32, this could be our chance. And all of these guys are going, well, if he can get knocked out top 32, and Alex oh, Olovny can, can beat him, yep. I can beat anybody. Yep. So now everyone's starting to believe. They're starting to believe the momentum. And will Ali Makshid or Manuel Vaca believe more in this second half of their one more time battle? You can see the damage, the tire, the rubber all over these cars at this point. They've taken a tough beating. It's only around two, folks. And these cars are already looking a little tired. But that's how hard they are driving, how hard they're competing for a spot in the top 16. Makshid to lead them in. Back Kind of follow Vaca's right there on the inside, and this is where Radulu made the error. But no such errors for Manuel Vaca. Nice chase run so far. He's a little bit in the smoke cloud now. He's going to get a little blind, a little early transition. Maxine way too late on the transition, but he makes it work. He does drop a wheel, and then Vaca is in the smoke cloud. He doesn't know where he is right now, Vaca, and he shuts it down. I don't know if he knew where he was on the track right there. Has he got the same mechanical issue, or was that just a case of I have no idea? Where
where I am, I've got to shake down. But it looks to me like Max Seed gets away with that one. So you know what? Looking back at that one, Max Seed put down an absolute ripper of a qualifying run there, like in a lead position. If he did this yesterday, he would have scored way, way higher. Look at this very nice initiation. Carries a lot of speed and he positions the car so well. Look at the way he picks up that inside zone perfectly. Comes right out to the edge of the circuit. Job done. And Ali Max Seed all the way down this hill. Look at this. Very nice line. Okay, a wheel too wide, but he picks up that inside zone. Probably only one mistake, and that was on the next outside zone where he dropped a wheel. Apart from that, Max Seed was flying. I think it looks to me that you can see the cloud fire up from, from Vac. He had no idea where he was. We, once he went into he that lost, smoke, yeah, he, was he lost, but right here, he has no idea where the edge of the track is. He hits the edge of the track. I think he goes, oh, I don't know where I am or what I'm doing, and then shuts it down. And by the time he gets out of that smoke cloud, he's in the grass. He yeah. doesn't know where he is. So I think this one is going to be, you know, I don't think the judges will welcome this easier decision, <laughs> I think, than they've had so far in this top 32. But to me, that looked very... Uh, Look at the tyre uh, marbles just on the... Oh, no, that's not the tyre marbles. That's going a little bit off the track for Ali Maksheed. Again, Manuel Vaca, it looked to me like this would, could have been his weekend. He looked very, very strong. He looked very, very comfortable. He was he was in the zone, but Ali Maksheed on his debut in Drift Masters, as far as I can see, and as far as the judges can see, is going through to the top 16. Ali Maksheed from Kuwait gets the win and goes through to the Drift Masters top 16. Never had a Kuwaiti in the top 16 of no. a European Championship before. History being made, and couldn't be a nicer guy to make. It. To me, Ali Maksheed, one of the uh, the shining lights of Middle Eastern drifting, has shown a, a real grasp of the technical side of the sport, and he's won so many trophies. Uh, we've worked with him in the past over in many different championships there, and a super nice guy, very uh, professional. And you know what? We're going to hear from him now. Becky, Ali Maksheed, the first Kuwaiti ever into the top 16 in Drift Masters. Absolutely, Dave. You must be delighted because I know we had a chat yesterday and you were saying this car, the steering, it's putting a little bit of the fear inside of me. And here you are. You've just come through to your first top 16. But it wasn't easy. That first battle, walk us through it. We'll give you a <laughs> That's OK. I'll give you a second. She's just uh, getting ready for his interviews. No problem. There we go. Yeah. Uh, it certainly wasn't easy. We had a lot of trouble yesterday in practice, and even today we had a little incident that cost us the entirety of the of practice. And uh, I mean, it was uh, go hard or go home. We just sent it, and unfortunately, I mean, it was it was fortunate at the, uh, at the end. We had uh, the clutch was slipping, and that caused us a lot of trouble chasing Manuel. So, uh, but fortunately for us, he had a problem as well that gave us one more time. And the car, uh, uh, I don't know, they just. The car put out and, and we're in the top 16. I'm very happy. Um, I can't wait for the rest of the day and I hope the clutch uh, stays with us to the end of the event. I hope the clutch stays with you as well. You, you were talking about the steering. Has that steering issue uh, got a bit better? Because you were saying that it was struggling to go uh, centre center back. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot better, but still uh, not where I want it to be. It's heavy and it's, uh, it's hard to return. So I'm struggling in the car. I'm kind of fighting the car. But uh, let's see. And uh, the problem is we can't uh, we can't add grip because of the clutch. The clutch keeps uh, slipping. So let's hope we have enough pace and I can manage to maybe chase a bit better than I did in top 32. So so yeah. Okay. Well, good luck and congratulations. And we'll see you in top 16. Back to you guys. Thank you very much, Becky. And yes, another car that is feeling the pressure from this competition and this gnarly track here in Sweden. The clutch, well, will it hold on for Ali Maxi for the rest of the day? He has Jakob Boschkonski in the top 16 later on this afternoon. We'll find out how that can do when we get to that part of the day. When we move it along to the next battle on the line, it will be Benedikt Tascherba to take on Norbert Zamic, the Hungarian driver, looks across at the Lithuanian and says, well, I've known you for a while, and I know how good you are, and I've seen you traveling around the world in these crazy BMW Eurofighters doing damage to multiple European champions. But Sherba sits in the car, cool, calm, and collected as always, and he says, I am ready for this. I took a little look out the window as well. Ian Oren Nielsen going up and down the straight as well. It looks like they might have got yeah. the car ready for his battle. We'll get to that soon, but this is a big one. Norbert Zamic has taken down big names in the past. Sherba has taken big names down in the past, and I think everyone's had a little look over it with the big championship contenders under pressure. All eyes were on Vjansek and Rovan Perez this weekend. They're both out of competition. It could be anybody's from here, and both of these guys are starting to believe. I certainly are starting to believe. I think everybody here is starting to believe that any Anybody can be on the podium at the end of the day today. 
Who will it be? Well, we don't know that yet. We have many more battles to go. But Benedict Escherba sits on the line, laser focused, looking at those lights, ready to get the green light to go to lead out the Hungarian Norbert Zamic cars. Slot into gear. Zamic starts to creep through that chicane. Trying to get a little run in on the very fast Lithuanian as they come through the gears down for the initiation. Zamic initiates before Benedict Escherba, but he makes no odds as the pace and grip from Cherba are unmatched as he wavers and wobbles into the outside zone, looks for the transition back. Cherba on it, big hand oh! The big contact from Norbert Zamic. And you know what, it's going to come down to that handbrake drag. Yep. It's going to come down to that, because Kevin O'Connell, you know what, he's been explaining it all weekend. It may not be obvious to the, to the viewer or someone watching on in the grandstands, but if you pull the handbrake too early on that D-cell, it, it is going to hurt the chase car. And I don't know if Zamic was on too much of a flyer with too little angle and coming in too hot, or Cherba had done too much D-selling, but not too sure. I'm not it's a, too it's sure. a big yeah. lockup from, and I'm, I'm also looking at it. It's almost six and one half dozen of the other yeah. because Cherb is on the right line and he's not really doing anything too wrong. But watch the hand here, early handbrake from Cherba, and then Zamich. Is Zamich coming in too fast? He lost the ground on the first corner and tried to, you know, torpedo through the track because Zamich is on all well, four wheel lockup. Well, this is an lock onboard, onboard from Zamich right now as he comes down. Oh, and he just appears through the smoke. And, and this there is going is. to be decided for me, Ian, on this decision because there's a D bead on Zamich's car. So Zamich has lost a rear tire, which means he won't be able to take to the next battle. If he's deemed at fault, this would give it to Cherba because he can't continue. But if it's the fault of Cherba, Zamich would be allowed the time to put tires on the car. Now, that's just my initial provisional standpoint on it, even though I've been known to be wrong. Uh, but I think that's, look at this, he's absolutely slammed into the side of Cherba here. Cherba's in a borrowed car, remember, ladies and gentlemen, this weekend. This is not his current car. This is the car he championed last year, sold the car, broke his car at, uh, a couple of weeks ago and said, why don't I have that car back just for a weekend? I promise I'll find it. And here he is getting slammed into at 60 miles an hour. So um, interesting to see which way the judges will go. And they're getting a tough, a tough go of it here in the top 32 of the judges because it's a very, it's a track that's very balanced on decel and acceleration. As you can see, Zamich creeping back to the start line, hasn't got a tire on that rear wheel. So for me, he cannot take off the line now with a D-beat. So the decision from the judges will be who is at fault. And I just heard it in my ear. I, hopefully, you know, I heard it right, because you were talking at the same time. I was trying to listen to three voices all at once. I do believe that Benedict Tascherba has been deemed at fault. So Norbert Zamich will get the opportunity to change the tyres on the back of that car. Makes perfect sense to me. I'm just going to go quickly. Kevin, if you're yep. there. Kevin, looks like to me like Tascherba went way too early on the handbrake there. Yeah, that, that was clearly Cherba's fault. So what we uh, outlined in our briefing this morning is where the deceleration zones are. And the deceleration zone is at the start of outer zone four. And if you look at this replay, you can see right now that Cherba already is on the handbrake and foot, on the foot brake as well. That is at least six, seven meters before we were expecting them to be decelerating. Norbert had no way of knowing that he was going to be decelerating in that part of the track and therefore he could not uh, predict that uh, where Cherba was going to be or the speed that he was going to be at. Therefore Cherba is 100% at fault for that and Norbert can have 10 minutes to repair his car. So from that perspective, I mean, I mean, not only have we history made today with many different things, but Ian and I were correct. Uh, in, in again, our, again, this, we're getting too good at this, Dave. We're going to need a, what, a bit of a reality this, check. This too. event is definitely backwards. We're correct. We're correct. Uh, and a lot of things are happening on track that we didn't <laughs> expect. So you don't want to take your eyes off it, folks, because you watch drifting and you say, oh, it's a predictable game. Everything's going to happen the way we think it's going to happen. And then we have all these notes in front of us here that say, oh, what's the likelihood of this and that? Well, I've taken all those notes and thrown them away because I have no idea. Sure, but comes into that to me as the favorite, makes the bigger mistake. Samich now gets a huge advantage, and we will see the second half of that battle when Zamich has another uh, set of tires put on that car. Normally not allowed to change tires, just no. to clarify, but because it wasn't his fault that the tire came off, he is allowed time to change that tire. We move on to our next battle. And, I mean, if you're watching this as a spectator, this is exactly what you want from drifting. Absolute madness. Madness, yep. Predictability and a championship blown absolutely wide open before you've even got out of the top 32. Yeah, amazing. Just what we want. Right, up on the line next, it will be Marco Zakril to take on another Swedish driver, Joachim Andersson, pulls to the line. 
did it all on his first qualifying run yesterday, Yoki Anderson. We've seen some good things from this young man, but Marco Zakaril in the past has been phenomenal. Yeah, I think Marco Zakaril hasn't shown, I would say in the last year and a half. Hasn't shown his cards. Hasn't shown his cards on the table because he is a top contender. We've watched him battle for podiums, and then he just lost a little bit of form. Whether that was mental, whether it was mechanical, we don't know. He had some mechanical issues across the way as well. Now, looking at his practice, looking at his qualifying, he's back on form, but this man, Anderson has been a force to be reckoned with in the last year or so. So you've got two people here trying to prove themselves. They, they want to get to that top 16. Obviously, Joachim Anderson is the local boy. He's got all of the support behind him. But I don't think it's going to mar matter at all to Zacharyl. He's going to want to be the guy to go to the top 16. This is going to be an interesting one. And as we've watched every battle, it's almost the track decision-making throughout the track that's cost a lot of people a lot of runs and mechanical failures. So you've just got to keep it clean, make the right decisions, and hold the car holes together, and you'll go to the top 16. We haven't seen too much of a battle just decided on driving this far. So let's see what happens as they come off the line. Zacharyl in the lead position, Anderson in the chase. Anderson losing a lot of ground and got a lot of angle. It's not the right approach from Anderson. He's got to play a little catch-up here. Zacharyl so fast in that BMW M2, but barely grazing that outer zone. Zacharyl early on a decel as well. It doesn't affect Anderson, though. And look at this, Anderson's out stuck in the smoke, trying to always oh, making big errors in the chase position, trying to get back into this one. He does cut the course, but he's on the wrong line. And oh, Zacharyl has a mechanical fader, and we just spoke about it. As Anderson says, what is happening, and gets across the line. Another favorite for me, falling victim to something wrong with his car, and he's getting out of it pretty quickly. I wonder if like there's um, something on the windscreen. I don't know if that's condensation from a fire or if There. What has happened there? But right. It looks like we're going to see your old friend out in I'll action. I'll tell you what, he's the MVP. The only man that doesn't have to worry about mechanical failures this weekend is Johnny Scoops. He'll be out. Oh, no. No, Zachary says, I don't want to go with Johnny Scoops. I want to go back to the start line. So something strange has gone on there. Was it an electrical cut out? Was it a a failure in the car, did the car overheat and the ECU shut it down? Something very unusual. I'm sure we'll, we'll hear more about it in the future. Hard for us, uh, especially with such a distance away from the cars where we are right now to know exactly what's happening. The car seems to be driving okay, which would mean that it was uh, an intermittent fault because if it was differential, he wouldn't be going back this fast. And it looks like the car is steering okay, so I'm not too sure. Maybe he looked down and there was something to do with a, a relay or something going in the car. Was there a technical gremlin? Was there an electrical gremlin? Let's go down to Becky. Becky, have you any news for us of what is going on down there? Marco Zacharo is shutting it down. Yes, absolutely, Dave. He did shut it down. And there seems to be what is like a little bit of oil on the top of the bonnet there. I asked him directly. I said, what is it? Did something pop or anything like a hose? And he said, I don't actually know myself. But what he is doing is he said he's going to give it another go. He's going to head back to the start line. So hold on to your hats. We don't know how this one's going to run out. Hopefully that car can stay together for, this, for the rest of this battle. Thanks, Becky. Great to have Becky down there giving us the information that we're, we're desperately needing. Finding because, it all out. Yeah, and now Marco Zacco says, I don't know what's wrong with the car. I have no idea what that was. I'm just going to go drifting again. And I guess he has no choice because he has no time to fix it. So no. he's got, come this far from the Czech Republic all the way to Sweden. He may as well go for it. But however, how does Joachim Anderson deal with this? He's got a car that he doesn't know is even going to initiate. Is either going to drive or anything's going to happen. And Joachim Anderson is going to have to take I it. I think they're going to... Oh, are they going to oh, so we're hearing word that he didn't make it back to the line on time. There was only two minutes allotted for these guys to get back to the start line. And unfortunately for Marco Zakara, where he was down there with the fire marshals, with the safety team, he was out of time. Joachim Anderson, obviously, you know, 
he had to stay down there. He, you know, he made his way back as quickly as he could. But Marco Zakaril's car, because it wasn't running and able to get back within those allotted two minutes, he has been disqualified for competition. And he couldn't restart the car in time. That's what happened there. He was stuck on the grid, not being able to know what was going on. Joachim Madison's been, and what I like about it is he's been informed, Joachim Madison, that he's won the battle. But he wasn't pleased about it. No, you could see it in his in his facial expressions. He was like, "Oh, there was no celebrations. There was no fist pumps. It was all really. We're not going to get to run We're this. We're not going to do it. Yeah. Um, so Joachim Anderson is going to do a run. All he's got to do is prove that he can get through the first corner on drift or initiate into the first corner, and he's going to win this battle. Not the way he wanted it, but I just cannot believe every single battle in this top 32 has either been a collision, a mechanical, a off the track." Something crazy has happened. I, I mean, it's been really a test of all of these drivers to just get through it. And we're only at top 32 level. So as we get closer to the end of this competition, I'm very curious to see who's going to survive. What, su what car survives is my big question. Survival is, it seems to be the big thing here because these cars are, you know, a lot of these guys go, well, why is this car is breaking all the time? I mean, let's be honest. These cars have the best of every single thing you can put in a drift car. Sequential gearboxes, dog boxes, quick change rear oh, ends. Oh, his reaction. Look when he finds out. And they're still breaking down. So it, it goes to show the pressure they're under. And Zachary, you can see, absolutely devastated with the decision. Now, it might have been the clever thing because when he goes back to the pit area now and discovers something really wrong, he could have blown that car up on that second run. And I also think, let's be honest, he had an incomplete from his first run. Joachim yeah. Anderson, all he had to do was just go around the track. So if Joachim Anderson, can, and he will do that. So I don't think Zachary really had much of a chance there until Zach, probably Joachim Anderson breaks down or something. But I, I'll be honest, I think Joachim Anderson would have probably got the job in there anyway yeah. with, with, with his level of driving ability. So. Um, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be Joachim Anderson just putting on a show for the fans right now, for the, the home fans here in Sweden. And he looks good, Joachim Anderson. He looks strong. He looks like the car is working. It looks like he's feeling comfortable. Um, he did say he didn't have the best of rounds at Mondello in round one. He was a little disappointed with his result, but I think he'll be happy. He would have looked at the, the bracket come up. He would have looked at Zachary and said, that's going to be a tough one. That's going to be a, a tough battle to actually win. And it looks to me like he's had pretty much an easy run of it there because he's got right through it. So it is going to be Joachim Anderson. Anderson moves forward to our top 16, which is a very unpredictable top 16 so far. And one for me that I definitely wouldn't have put down on paper given previous form. But I'm also a little excited to see how unpredictable this championship is going to be for the rest of the season. Joachim Anderson, the official decision is in and he will go through to the top 16. No questions there, Ian. A very simple decision. There's been a couple of tough ones for the judges so far. There certainly has been a few tough decisions for the judges so far. And, and you know what? They'll take these wins when they get an easy decision, uh, mechanical failures, making their life easy upstairs because I'm telling you now as we move further forward into competition, when we get to that final form, when we get to those final battles, it will be harder. We're going to move it along to a man that a few hours ago, everybody here would have said, there is no way he's going to make it to the start line to compete. And Pontus Hartman would have said, oh, I've got a buy run into top 16. But Oran Nilsson and that crew and these Swedish will not give up. Oran Nilsson pulls to the line in a car that looks like it's fresh out the scrapyard, Dave, it's but it's working. And he's... It and he's waving to the starline marshal saying, didn't expect to see me again hey, so soon. Hey. <laughs> One of our media guys came back to me and they counted 38 people fixed that car. 38 people were working on that car to get it back out. An hour and a half ago, he was out of the game. Pontus Hartman is applauding he's his pulled, opponent, push it. Yeah, he, saying that he's rolled over twice in practice and the car is still back together. Back of it doesn't even look like it was in a crash. And Oran Nielsen said he got out of the car, he had dust in his eyes, he actually couldn't see what was happening. No. He was crawling on the ground. There was so, many, so much dust. The GoPro was found about 50 feet from the car. That's how big that impact was. And here he is in the top 32, ready to throw down. And if we know Oren Nielsen, it will not shake him one bit. So here we go. You can see the engine actually hit the ground twice in that rollover. Incredible stuff. And Oren Nielsen, he's praying to the drift gods right now, <laughs> saying Sweden, last year he took off into the sky with four wheels off. Them. This year he rolls over. And this year he's still in the top 32. Pontus Harman says, what I got to do to get rid of this guy? Well, you're about to find out. You certainly are ready to find out. Your third place qualifier fires in. Oren Nielsen on an absolute flyer. Puts foot to floor as he fires through that first inside zone. Catches a little bit of understeer, but no big mistake now as Oren Nielsen looks for that outside zone down on the hill. Gets in time perfectly. Just about drags a wheel through that second inside zone, transitions back. Pontus Hartman not in the fight though, mid-track, wheels on the curb as Pontus Hartman desperate to get a wheel onto the door of Oren Nielsen's Toyota Sora as he goes onto the wall across the line. What a guy it's is Oren Nielsen. Incredible scenes and the whole audience here know because that most of those audience were in pit lane yep. watching those guys work on that car. I mean, think about it this way. 
If you rolled your car and you went to an auto body repair and said, look, I've rolled my car twice, uh, I need you to fix it. They're going to be like, whoa, it's going to be a couple of months. No, it'll be a new car. It'll be a it'll new be, car. Just, be get, off. just get a new one. Look at this. He does catch understeer there. The car hopping through that first corner. And uh, I'm not sure that car uh, suspension setup wise is 110%. Not at all. But he comes through that first corner, hopping the front wheel off the tarmac and still makes it work. The line in the outside zone, full throttle once again. He is on point, Dave. Nothing to lose at this point now. No, point is Harman. I mean, he's, he's desperately trying to catch up here. It doesn't make too much of an impact in this battle for me. There's nothing majorly wrong either. I think we should ban the word impact from Oran Nielsen from Yeah, nothing, no impact no for Oran, please. We've had enough impact for one day. But what I would say is that, you know, Oran Nielsen, one of the most talented up-and-comers on the grid. So is Pontus Harman. These guys are going to be, you know, I think in the mix for podiums very, very soon. If not today, it's going to be soon. But what I love about it is the fight. It, it, I love about it is that the whole of the pit lane coming together to get that car back out on the grid. And I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, that engine hit the ground twice and it crushed everything and they just replaced everything and they put it back together. They made a new windscreen. You even explained it. The track owner got in his car, drove to someone who somehow had a Lexan window for a SOAR and collected it for Oran Nielsen. The owner of this entire facility helping Oran Nielsen get back out there again. And as you can see in the pits, everybody watching on, they've, they've had a tough all morning. Every team's had a tough all morning. You can see Adam Zalewski's dad there. They've had a very tough morning yeah, tough with an engine failure. But they all know the pain. They all, they all work. As they say, it's one family behind the scenes. It's all enemies on the track. And that's the way Driftmasters is. And here we go. Pontus Hartman will be in the lead position. Oran Nielsen in the chase. What can Oran Nielsen produce? Can Hartman put the pace down in that E46. Here we go. Here we go. Oren Nielsen looks for the back bumper of that BMW E46. A little bit of separation opens up. Pontus Hartman dabbing the foot brake, trying to get that car settled on the right line. Oh, and understeer from Oren Nielsen, but he keeps a hold of it. Manages to make it work now as he dives down the inside, looking for the side. Big understeer again. Oren Nielsen's car still not 100%, but he loses a lot of ground to Pontus Hartman. He's going to go wheels on the inside, making the same mistakes Hartman made in his chase as he cuts the inside massively. Looks for the door, but it's scrappy from Nielsen in the chase. Yeah, look to me that there's a problem with the front end of Nielsen's car. That understeer is, is uncommon. We've watched practice and watched it. Watch the front wheels on the car as he comes through that first corner. Completely loses grip as he comes through. Has this big wobble, this understeer moment. As he, Look, watch the front. Starts to straighten up. That's a considerable straighten for Moran Nielsen there. And it puts him on sort of the wrong line. He's on the inside of the course. Now he's sort of overtaking the lead car. This is where the separation occurs because he gets understeer again. Can't go on the throttle quick enough and Harman is gone. He's absolutely gone at this point. To be honest, Pontus Harman's lead was excellent, very, very good. Have to say, Hartman for me in the first two events this year has really impressed. If you talk about drivers that have improved their skill level from one year to the next, Hartman's got to be right at the top of that. Oh, he certainly has, Dave. And you know what? We see him in Germany a year ago, and, and he had a big impact with the award. He said, This is not me. I know I'm better than this. And he's come back this year with a new mindset, a whole new uh, way of thinking about this game, and he's really making it work. And you know what, Pontus Hartman, once keep your eye on as we move through this championship, a, a top eight finish at round one. If he does, it again, Dave. He's still really in the mix. He's on the roof of his car and he's cheering to the crowd. He's applauding. I think personally, Oran Nielsen is just happy to have made it back out there. A hundred percent. And I mean, that, that's what he wanted, to give it a, a fighting chance. Um, I think he's, he's made some errors along the way. However, we got a decision in and it's going to be Pontus Hartman gets the win. Pontus Hartman gets the win and goes through. And the Swedish driver uh, will please the fans. However, Oren Nielsen will be in our hearts forever after this weekend. And Oren Nielsen uh, does make it back out to the line. It's been a very, very emotional roller coaster for him. And Pontus Hartman will move through to our top 16. Um, it looks to me like those understeers from uh, Oren Nielsen and not enough uh, to overturn any mistakes from Pontus Hartman and Hartman was pretty solid throughout both runs. So it's the fair call as we move back to the one more time battle between Benedikt Ascherba. Oh, sorry, this is the no, second half second of the battle of the run. between Norbert Zamich and Benedikt Ascherba. Zamich has put tires on the car and Cherba has been deemed at fault. So a big disadvantage to Cherba right now. Yeah, certainly a big disadvantage to Cherba right now. He is going to be hoping that Norbert Zamich makes a mistake in his lead now, uh, kind of making this battle nil void done over so that they can go at it maybe again in a one more time to get the job done cleanly but Norbert Zamich will not want that to happen so I've got a feeling that Zamich is going to come in here faster than he has all weekend to try and drive away from the Lithuanian driver try and put Benedikt Ascherba in a position where he's not comfortable to chase. I'm going to disagree with you. Oh! I think Norbert Zamich is playing safe here. I think he's just going for a safe pass of the course. There is no way. He has to because he's got a massive advantage here. So as long as he just goes around this course smoothly... Forget it. He's not going to do it. He's coming in hot, Dave. Look at this. The body panel is barely holding on. 
but Sherman knows he needs to be on the door, and he is on the door as he absolutely glues that BMW to the side of that S13. They come down the hill. Zamich on a really nice line, could have been deeper, but he shallows up the angle, and that opens up the door for Cherber on the transition. Zamich, a big mistake again. Cherber on the inside. Transition back, final outside zone coming as Cherber goes, wheels over. Zamich out of the zone. This one is a catastrophe. Yeah, and, and that's... I mean, luckily for Norbert Zamich, he had a big advantage from the first one because he wouldn't after the second one. That's a big error from Zamich in the midsection of the course, and Cherba was all over him from the start. Cherba knew, though. Cherba knew he had to do something spectacular here to force an error from Zamich. Zamich actually does pretty good all the way up until... Uh, and at this point, I think Zamich's on a, a brilliant lead run. Now he makes a big error. He just sort of doesn't come on the throttle properly, over pushes the corner. Very lucky to stay on the tarmac. Could have been much worse for Zamich, but it, it, it's almost a straighten afterwards. It's a little messy. And then Cherba, all this messiness from Cherba is because of Zamich. Yeah. So Cherba is not going to be blamed for this. He's going to get an advantage from this run for sure, but it's not going to be enough of an advantage to overturn the big hit oh. on the first side, which is unfortunate for Cherba and lucky for Zamich in many ways. But I'm Zamich... Just, I'm just looking back at these moments of straightening, and I'm going to say that Kevin O'Connell mentioned it a few moments ago in another battle. If there was two, three seconds of straightening, it would be deemed as a zero. Well, the thick plottons, as they say. <laughs> I think you got the words right in the wrong way. But this, <laughs> but today, nothing is wrong. Nothing yeah. is wrong today. You uh, can I'll, say what you want today. I'll tell you one thing that <laughs> we're being the rule book. Oh, it's, 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 the pages are being curled <laughs> from the amount of flicking through the rule book today because it, it's really tested not only the the Driftmasters uh, technical crew who are watching all of this, but also the judges who are trying to decipher who's the winner and loser of all these battles. It's not easy, and it's going to be down to mistakes from Zamich. Are they enough to overturn the big mistake from Cherba? And I think that's going to be the decision that's going to be made here. As the score drops in, you can see how nervous both of these guys are because they don't know, Ian. They don't know which way this one's going to go. It's, it's, it's either going to be a win for Zamich or one more time as far as I can see it. Um, so let's see which way it goes. The judges still deliberating, having a little talk about this one. The decision hasn't dropped in as quickly as we would have expected, which means there is more to the tale. And here we go, decision in. Is it Zamich? Is it Cherba? It's going to be a one more time, one more time. And Benedict as Cherba, he believes now because he has got away with that one. He made a big error. And Zamich, he just had to keep it clean. Kevin O'Connell, but he didn't keep it clean. Yeah, unfortunately for Zamich, he just, as you said, he did not keep it clean. He had two major errors there where he actually straightened up and had to reinitiate again. And as we said earlier in the battles, that would be deemed as an incomplete. Also, just didn't note as well, that is also an unchaseable run as well. So Cherba had nowhere to go behind him. So we deemed that to be an incomplete. Overturns it and we have to see him go one more time. I am a prophet. I said it was the one more time. It wasn't a mistake because it is a one more time. So we are going to see them go back at it again. Oran Nielsen getting an amazing reception from all of the drivers on pit lane there as he rolls back into the pits. An amazing moment for a young man that, uh, I mean, many drivers after that would have just sat down and said, it's not my weekend. But he got back out there. He put a fight up against Pontus Harman. It wasn't enough. But it's enough to, to you know, warm our hearts. So and we move is. on to one man that's been looking at that exit of Peter Vjainsek in the top 32 and saying, hold on a minute, and that's Jack Shannon. Yeah. And that's Kevin Piscolti. But he's going up a steely competitor. And yeah. look at the way the bracket is sitting. Piscolti leads out Shanahan for the first half of the run. Piscolti higher qualifier. Piscolti is a higher qualifier. Piscolti has been growing. We keep saying it. We keep mentioning this growth, this earning of this championship. Piscolti's been on fire this weekend. He's looking strong. But Jack Shanahan yesterday said he wasn't in the right mindset. Is he in it today? They fire in. Piscolti absolutely ripping as he starts to cloud Jack Shanahan in that tyre smoke. They come round to the outside zone. And Piscolti is absolutely dark. But Shanahan's still with him. On to the door he goes. They come down. Down. They look for the transition. Shanahan not letting Piscotti get away as he shallows off the angle, makes a little dive, looks to tuck that GT6 up onto the door of the BMW. Piscotti goes for the wall, but Shanahan's on him. Nice chase run from Jack Shanahan, but Kevin Piscotti's lead run was exceptional. Gave at Shanahan everything to work with there from start to finish. And after so many sketchy runs in that top 32, we see two guys go out and manhandle that track, show that it works, show that it can be done in the right way. Kevin Piscotti, every round for me, is great growing in stature. He's putting fear into some of the biggest names in the game. And you know what? I was just thinking through that run. Is today the day that the tide turns, that our predictable top 10 
becomes an unpredictable top 50 because anybody can win it. Because right now, Kevin Pascalti has matched Jack Shanahan move for move on the first half of this battle and done a great job. And Jack Shannon would have been expecting maybe a wobble here or there, maybe a mistake for Pascalti, but the Pascalti of old, maybe, not the Pascalti of new. He is not making errors. The Heinehans, the Pascaltis, these guys are starting to grow as competitors in this championship. Although, you've got to give it to Jack Shannon. He does nothing wrong on that run. He puts it to the door where he needs to, and he's very much still in this fight. For me, Shanahan may be taking a small advantage at the end just for the proximity, but Pascalti very much in the fight. He certainly is very much in the fight. He falls back to the start line, and he's on the radio to the spotters asking them what he can do. Where was Shanahan? Where was he positioned? What can Piscolti do to get this one done in the bag and move forward into top 16 to dispatch Jack Shanahan from this top 32? And I mean, that's possible because everything is possible in Driftmasters because we've learned that today and Piscolti is not going to be afraid of Shanahan nope. here. He is not going to be thinking, oh, this is the guy that always finishes at the podium. He's the winner from last year. He's the top three in the championship. Piscolti wants to be where Jack Shanahan was and is and this is the time to prove it. Top 32. There is no walkovers here in Driftmasters. There is no formalities. There is just war on circuit and you're about to see another go to battle. It is Jack Shanahan in the lead position. He is a bit off form this weekend but watch him in the battles. He starts to grow as the competition grows and he's got to put on an exceptional lead run and pascotti has got to go for it here. He certainly has got to go for it. He looks like he is going to go for it. He initiates wider and faster than Shanahan. Shanahan opens up the throttle, tries to drive away. Pascotti shallows up the angle and keeps him within reach, though, as Shanahan goes for that wide line. They come down the hill and Pascotti matching everything that Shanahan did in his chase right now. They work their way in front of the grandstand. Shanahan starts to drive away. Pascotti shortcuts the circuit, looks for the dive, positions himself perfectly. Can he get into the outside zone or will he shortcut? He shortcuts it, but he makes it work because he goes door to door across the line. You know, I think for that, for me, and this is just from an analytical point of view, it was the first corner. I think Piscalti drops off the track before initiation, losing him that ground. And I've got to say, when the pressure was on Jack Shanahan, he performed. He came out there and did exactly what you expected him to do and put on a phenomenal lead run. Piscalti, he had moments here, but not the same amount of moments that Shanahan had. And he had to cut the track considerably to stay with Shanahan. I think it came down to that first corner. He just lost pace on Shanahan. He had to start getting a little scrambly through the middle, trying to cut the corners. Um, and Shanahan, you know, as we said, he wasn't feeling comfortable, but look at the line from Shanahan compared to some of the other drivers on this track. He may have not shown it in qualifying, but as we come to the battles, when it really matters for championship points, it looks like Jack Shanahan's got his, uh, his act together very quickly here in the top 32. And to be honest, Piscolti, nothing too bad in either run. Nothing amazing, I think, for maybe either driver in both runs, but just looking at both runs, the proximity did seem to be a little bit more uh, exciting from Shanahan in certain areas of the track. That's all I can pick apart, don't get me wrong. Phenomenal from both, but look at Piscalti cutting the track a little bit on the inside, a little shallow to make up those lines. We didn't see those errors from Shanahan in his chase run. That, to me, might be the you know, deciding factor in this one. I think you're right there, Dave, and I'm, I'm inclined to agree. I think that Shanahan's lead was put maybe a little bit better. And the chase positioning from Shanahan, where he positioned that car, being out of those zones for Piscalti was probably the nail in the coffin. Um, look, we wait for the decision to drop in. We're not the judges. And here we go. It is going to drop in. Who's going to take it through to the top 16? And we have got two votes for Jack Shanahan. He gets the win, advances through to the top 16. Piscalti dispatched. But never take your eye off that man, because he is doing big moves. Yeah, for sure. And he went up against a very top competitor. Kevin, I'm just going to throw quickly to you. Just a little bit more proximity from Jack Shannon. Was that the difference maker? That's how we saw it. It was a little bit over the lead and the chase, actually. If you look at ball runs, uh, Kevin and Jack both had great lead runs, but unfortunately, Jack just had a little bit cleaner, fulfilling more of those zones on that qualifying line. And then you look at the chase runs as well. He definitely had a little bit more proximity, better mimicking, and was matching the angle as well, while Kevin was actually trying to cut the track to maintain proximity. So over the lead, and the chase, Jack taking the win very slightly. Well, there you have it from Kevin O'Connell. It's Jack Shanahan moving on to the top 16, moving to our next battle, our la second last battle of the top 32. It is going to be Yuha Rintanen against Diogo Correa from Portugal, Finland versus Portugal. The whole north to south of Europe here in one battle and two very steely competitors. Let's see what happens in this one as Yuha Rintanen has been looking very strong all weekend. Takes on Diogo Correa, who sometimes can wake up in the morning and win a whole event. Here we go as they come through the intersection of that first corner. Looks like Yuha Rintanen's got this one dialed. The body work flexing with the speed that G R86 is carrying through the course. Look at this, the Finn absolutely flying. Diogo Correa with no answer whatsoever for Yuha Rintanen's pace right now, having to cut the course in that E92 BMW to stay in the fight. Yuha Rintanen looking like he is on.
Juhar Rittenden. Wow, what an incredible show in there from Juhar Rittenden. We've said it before and we'll keep on saying it until he retires, which we hope he never does. This man loves fast tracks. He loves the grip, he loves the speed. And Juhar Rittenden was so fast through there that Diogo Correa had no answer. From the initiation, as soon as he touched the throttle, Juhar Rittenden was up and gone, and Correa just was a passenger in that run. And also cutting the curbs, cutting yep. the track, just could not match the pace. And we know Rittenden's fast, but we've just proven it, how fast he is on this circuit. Um, you're talking probably the likes of uh, McKeever still in the competition at that kind of level of speed, maybe Connor Shannon. Um, you know, some of those guys that are incredibly fast on this circuit um, are going to be tough to battle because once you lose them, you've got to start cutting the track. So not only have you no proximity, but now you're making mistakes in the chase, making it even worse and making it easier for the judges. And unfortunately for Correa there, who we've watched be sensational in certain events and certain rounds, not finding his feet in 2023 just yet. But hey, we're only halfway through and I've seen many <laughs> battles in this top 32 go exactly the opposite way when we turn them around. Yeah, we certainly do. And uh, look at this from Yuha written and gets that to the wall and the flying fin is up and gone. Diogo Correa now a huge weight on his shoulders to try and perform an incredible lead run. Uh, but he knows uh, that Yuha written and uh, is going to try and position that GR86 in, a, in such a way that the judges have no question whether to put him through to top 16. Well, for me now, Rintanen has got to show the pace of the chase. He's got to yep. get closer. I mean, we know Correa could not match it. Simple for Rintanen. His spotter is going to say to him, hey, Yuha, if you get close here, Correa was not close at any point. So no. just some proximity throughout the course. It doesn't have to be wing mirror to wing mirror. It can be a couple of feet back, but you're going to take the win here and go to the top 16. And Yuha Rintanen is experienced enough to take that information and process it and make it happen. So Correa, I think he's got to throw caution to the win and go absolutely bananas here because that's all he can do. It's going to be interesting to see if Yuha can manage that aggression. Yeah, let's see what he can do as he slots that car through the gears and Diogo Correa starts to pull a little bit around the way. Correa now, he opens up the throttle, starts to drive away. As you are written and now looks for the door at BMW, the transition written and closer than Correa as they come down into the slower section now through that second inside zone. They look for the transition back, no separation as you are written and doesn't make any mistakes, keeps it within the track limits. Goal oh, goes for the transition. I thought he was going to make contact there. Squeezes the throttle. He's out of that last outside zone, but he's wheel to wheel across the line. Yeah, I thought you are written and was going to get there. the nose taken off his car and pushed off, off the track. The track yeah. And it would have been his fault for staying too late in it, but he managed, and I don't know how. I'd love to see the replay from the other angle how he got out of that because it looked to me for a split second like he was going to throw it all away yeah incredible showing there from you are written a very experienced driver he's been all around the world driving cars for many many years now and you are written and knows how to position this even brand new build that was just you know, unveiled at round one. He's still not worried about putting it door to door. Correa, though, doesn't really do a bad job in the no, lead position. No, this is the bad part for me. Watch, Rintanen gets pinned on the inside here. How does he get away with this? Just, I love this angle here is going to tell us all. So it looked to me like Rintanen was going to get into the back. Wow. Oh, he just hits the front brake and twists it back. He does very well there, because that could have gone wrong very fast. Um, and it, you know what? He got back on the door towards the end. This may be an obvious decision, I think, for the judges. I'm not seeing anything too untoward across those two runs. It looks to me like Rintanen just doing enough, having enough proximity to make Diogo Correa's lack of proximity look even worse. That's the way I'm seeing it. Let's see if the judges see it the same way as we look for a decision for our top 16. And it is going to be Yuha Rintanen getting the win. Yuha Rintanen gets the win. The Finnish fans in the grandstand will be another Finn into the top 16. And we have got Becky down there. She's with Oran Nielsen. And Becky, the story of the day for sure. What a heroic performance from Oran Nielsen. Heroic, that is absolutely right, Dave. And I'm going to say it from all of us here. It takes a big pair of cojones to get back on the horse once it's chucked you off. So well done for getting out onto the track. Now, can you try and walk us through that moment when that roll happened? What, did you know immediately that it was going over or did it all just happen in a second? I mean, I was going through the first corner and uh, chasing Nakamura, which is my idol. So I was trying to give my chase uh, good, but um, I, I felt that I went off the line and washed out of the track. And I was just thinking, just save it now. And then all of a sudden I hit the gravel and I was thinking, okay, I can save this one. I will just roll on the grass. And then the car just flips and I, I didn't have time to think really. And my eyes got filled with gravel. and. Uh, the car was all, I mean, it, it looked worse than it was because the car, the team has worked incredibly hard to fix the car. I wouldn't, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's been an emotional roller coaster now. I've been crying so much and <laughs> uh, 
Oh, yeah. It's incredibly emotional. I mean, your nervous system right now must just be an absolute overload. But what I will say is you were telling me just there that in that chase battle, it was fine in the lead because you could see out the front, but because of your eye, you were driving with one eye closed. So it was just a little bit too much in the chase to just keep up with him. But again, Oren, you're driving with one eye closed. Like, give yourself a break. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank you. Uh, I just went out there and I was so smile I was smiling and crying at the same time through the first corner in the lead run because the car felt good actually and I hope that my eye would uh, hold through the, the chase run as well but that the sun and the smoke and everything was too much but what a victory to be out there and I just have to say so much thank you to all the teams Simon Lofsson and Kristen Allenson all of the guys that come over to help and uh, wow it wouldn't have been possible without so Thank you so much, Oren, and you know what? Congratulations for getting this far. It's a heroic effort after all. And there you go, new skill unlocked, drifting with one eye open. <laughs> Thank you very much, Becky. Yeah, one wide, well, one eye open drifting. I mean, there's a new one for Driftmasters and a new one for Oran Nielsen. And uh, you can see the emotion down there in the pitch. You can see how much it meant to him and all the guys around him. And a huge shout out to the drift community for jamming in and getting that car back on grid. We move it along to what could be potentially the final battle of our top 32. It will be Timu Pelota, Petola, sorry, to take on Victor Yonosu. This one. Where in the world would you ever see a battle like this in drifting? A diesel-powered Mercedes-Benz wagon to take on a BMW Euro Fire Sub E92. We're going to see it right now. Through the gears they come. Diesel smoke popping from the bonnet of the wagon as they open up the pole. Patola absolutely covers Yonosu in smoke, but he holds on to it. But now he's on the inside. Can he make it back? He certainly can. A little waver, a little wobble. They come down the hill. Look for that inside zone. The transition back perfectly timed for the team now as he works his way around and some ground lost for Victor as they transition to that final outside zone. Victor looking for the side of that Mercedes-Benz wagon and across the line takes the car. Timu is on a flyer, Dave. Yeah, it looked to me like the big mistake came from Victor when he transitioned too early. So he, he comes in a little too tight on the first corner. You can see he's rubbing the grass here, which is not where you want to be on the curb. Now watch how early he has to transition. He knows he's running out of space here. So he actually transitions way too early on the wrong part of the
second half of the run because they've still one half of this battle left to go. Benedict Sherba pulls up to the chase position and Norba Zamic pulls in to the chicane to lead out Sherba for the second half of this one more time battle. This one has to be decided. They get the thumbs up all round. Benedict Sherba now needs to get his one clean. No contact, good chase. And uh, going by what the judges say, keep to that qualifying line. If he hasn't got the pace, fires it in. And Norman Zamich a little shallow there. Weird initiation from Zamich, but starts to make it work now as Cherba keeps himself in a nice position, goes for the transition back, times it nicely. As Zamich comes down the outside zone, picks up that inner as he comes through now, looking for the grandstand transition back. Cherba ever so slightly off that qualifying line, but not as many mistakes as what Norman Zamich was making in his chase. Gets into that final outside zone, creeps up onto the door, as Zamich goes to the wall, almost contact, but a clean run in the bag finally. Yeah, two very clean runs, and again, not perfect. No. You know, from either, but I still think we're going to come back to that straightening from Norbert Zamich in the first run because that seemed to be the biggest mistake across all the runs. But then Zamich turns on an incredible lead run at times here and, and shows all the talent that he has. And it, it goes to show that Cherba and Zamich, a lot of talent, but not showing it consistently through both runs and errors being made. Uh, Zamich on an absolute flyer here. Like, look at the width of the track he's using. It's absolutely perfect. You're talking like an 80 plus qualifying run here uh, from Zamich. No issue wh whatsoever there. So, um, we're going to have a decision made at the end of this one. I think it's going to come down to, I feel, um, some big errors on the chase for Zamich. But again, I'm, I'm only holding on to that from previous experience of what's been called in this top 32. We're learning as we go in. We are. We Every day we is, said this, every day is a school day. We said this right at the beginning of the broadcast. We said that uh, we'd be all learning. Here yeah. we go. Decisions in. Quick decision made. And it's Benedict Cherba getting the win. And he thought he was on and out uh, after the first uh, hit with Norbert Zamich. He gets it one more time and he goes through. Kevin, quickly back to you. That Zamich straightening, was that the key? Yeah, absolutely. That was the defining factor in that battle for sure. Unfortunately, Zamich just completely shutting down, having a very similar mistake to his first incomplete. And uh, that was definitely the deciding factor in that battle. Thanks, Kevin. I'm going to put that down to maybe a mechanical failure because it happened so consistently in that part of the track that maybe Norbert Zamich has something going on with yeah. the car in that particular uh, part of the track. And then, of course, I'd say that, and then the next one, he absolutely flies through that part of the track, <laughs> so I have no idea either. So there you have it. Our top 32 is completed. It's incredible. I mean, a lot of... It's a provisional top 32. It looks like Laurie Heinehan going through. He's the man to beat. Adam Zalewski doesn't make it to the line with engine failure. Connor Shanahan goes through. Dylan Garvey with no clutch beats Michael Johansson. Dwayne McKeever, business as usual, takes down Eric Gottschall after an excellent battle. Rova Pair has a fire in the car. He's eliminated. And the rookie, Victor Vietmark, goes through. Kevin Pessor dispatches Michael Reihardt after another mechanical failure. Prishkonski beats Karkoshik after a very good battle. Vaka against Akshid comes down to another mechanical failure. Uh, Peter Vjansek against Alex Holovny. A collision at the end of that one was a big talking point. Oliver Randalu, Nakamura, and a big hit on the first corner there. Crash between those two guys. Nakamura gets the call. Cherba eventually beats Zamich after he shuts down in the chase. Zacharol gets knocked out by Joachim Anderson. A pretty straightforward one. Unfortunately for Arneas, that after a roll in practice, he doesn't stay on a roll. He gets knocked out against Pontus Hartman in the top 32. Pascalti and Shanahan was a great battle. And unfortunately for Pascalti, he came up against a big, a big uh, player early on in the competition. But Shanahan business as usual. Rintanen beats Correa, and you saw Timo Poltola beat uh, in the la uh, beat uh, Yunsu in the last battle. So here's the top 16 as it looks now. Heinehan against Shanahan as the first battle. Two Irish drivers, Dwayne McKeever and Dylan Garvey, go head to head. Then Kevin Pizor against Victor Vetmark. No idea. We've never seen those two battle before. Pishkonski against Maxhid, another unknown battle. And then we've got Naoki Nakamura against Alex Holovnia. Ukraine versus Japan. Where would you see it? Benedict Cherba against Joachim Anderson. Jack Shannon against Pontus Hartman and Yuha Rinton against the diesel-powered Mercedes of Timo Peltola. Well, if you haven't got your appetites wet right now, you're going to get a little breather before we head to our top 16. And that top 16, Becky, is lining up to be one for the history books. It's been a crazy top 32. What did you make of it? Absolutely crazy, Dave. I can agree with you there. So many collisions, so many moments, so many... I don't know, just whenever you come to a Driftmasters round, you know that you're going to get the unpredictable. I just need to get myself out of the way here before I get run over. As Norbert Zamich and Benedict Sierva come back to the pit. I mean, to go one more time again, and he finally got the job done. But you know what? It's all to play for. Top 16 is coming up. I mean, Laurie Heidenlund versus Shanahan, that's going to be a huge battle. This is all really starting to heat up. And do you know what? It's only round two. We've got another four to go. So who knows what's going to happen? Make sure you strap in. Go get yourselves a a couple of go get yourselves a cup of tea sorry get yourself something to eat because we're gonna be back at 5 55 p.m live
live on Red Bull TV. You're not going to want to miss this. I know it's going to be a bumper evening, afternoon. Gosh, I can't wait, guys. So make sure you join us back again, as I said, 5.55, and we'll see you here on Red Bull TV. See you later.